am, I want to say involved, but I'm in a lot of the groups like Choose FI or Afford Anything, uh, The Money Guy Show. I, I watch a lot of content on how to retire early. It was actually really important to me because I had made it to 40 without ever having $1,000 to my name, found myself as a single parent with three kids, uh, found out about $89,000 in bad debt in my name that I didn't know existed until the divorce. And uh, I've been laid off from a police department uh, in from the 2008 recession, found myself teaching truck driving at a truck driving school, making $17 an hour. So that was my starting position. And I tried for a, p a pension a couple of times. I, I tried the Marine Corps, but after Desert Storm, they, they downsized. And uh, with law enforcement, uh, after eight years, you know, the recession happened. And and with a lot of qualified officers, I found myself looking for work. And, and the idea of a pension kept getting taken away. So I thought, okay, how do people invest and create their own pensions? And there's three main paths that I found. The first one is starting and growing the business. I've tried that a couple of times. One time I shut it down because my ex emptied out the taxes and wages account. So that's not good business when that happens. And the other one, I actually just mismanaged it and had to close it down. So I found out I am not an entrepreneur. I'm an investor. And then you have the choice of stocks or real estate. So those are the three main. Yes, you can add crypto and a couple of other strategies. There's probably thousands of ways to do it. But the three main ones that are talked about in these, this, this financial independent retire early community, mostly is business, stocks, or real estate. But in almost every one of the fire uh, chat threads, it's 100% stocks. And some people will have a couple of rentals. And if you're in the one rental at a time community, it seems like everybody's talking about rentals. But when you're in those other groups where people are talking about retiring early, you know, not being a, a you know, trapped in, in that, that rat race where you have to work for the next paycheck, where life can be completely different once you make work optional. Imagine how much better your life is if you choose the job you want because you can and not because you need to because of the money. Or if you're super lazy like me, you just choose no job at all. If I invested in stocks, so this is what I want to be really clear on. Can you invest can you reach financial freedom and retire early without stocks? Here's my clarity. If I owned stocks, I would still have to work. So I want uh, people to understand that if you choose running a business, just because I'm not good at being an entrepreneur, doesn't mean that's not a good choice, right? And if you choose stocks, just because it's not my thing, doesn't mean that's not the right thing for you. There is no one right way. There's a right way for you, right? So if it's stocks, great. But here are the reasons why it's not right for me. First, when we talk about retirement accounts, most people associate retirement accounts with stocks, uh, timing your retirement with 59 and a half, right? So it, it immediately puts your retirement um, budget on a delayed gratification aspect where I'm going to retire when I'm old and hopefully able to enjoy it, right? The point of retiring early is having more time freedom for decades sooner, retiring at 30, 40, or 50, um, maybe even 60 for some people who think 70 is the normal retirement age. And, and doing it younger when you have the health to enjoy it. And you actually amplify your time, you know, instead of having three to five hours a day that are belong to you, I have 15 to 20 hours a day that belong to me to do whatever I want with, right? That's the point of retiring early. So the retirement account thing loses it for me because you're putting a timestamp on it. You're putting behind a paywall. You have to pay 10% penalty and the taxes on it to pull it out. Yes, with Roth IRA, you can avoid the taxes, but the, the benefit to Roth is that your money sits in there a long time to actually get the benefits of compound interest. So to put it in there and then take it out seems silly to me. So that's the main reason why I don't like retirement accounts. The two people who actually benefit retirement accounts, three, because the government benefits from almost everything you do. So we take the government out, but the two that actually benefit is one, retirement accounts benefit your employer. Right, it's a, a, a retention program. I've sat on several wheel boards for upon, for transportation companies, and they always talk about employee retention. Let's have a retirement account so we can keep our employees around longer. This is actually a company that calls our next thirty year employee. When people are changing jobs every two to four years to actually make more money, hardly anybody's thinking about being a thirty year employee anymore. So it's actually a really bad retention plan. But their retirement plan, they talk about how you can move from company to company. So it's a way to keep people for as long as possible. So they benefit. The other person is the people who manage your retirement accounts. So if you, uh, I was getting, uh, I was working on Joint Base Lewis McCord, helping people transition out of the military into finding gainful employment. So I ran a nonprofit that helped people find office and warehouse and management jobs with trucking companies, which actually helped the CDL school that I was at, but it helped the service members and spouses and dependents get jobs. So I felt good about it. But while I was on base, I actually dealt with a lot of financial planners who went to work for firms who manage 
business, who manage the accounts. Their goal, their headhunting, in my opinion, unethical strategy was to target service members getting out and say, come out and be a financial advisor so you can trick other service members into putting your money into these funds. So very predatory in my, my opinion. So I have a bad taste in my mouth when it comes to that. Not that there aren't good ones that are ethical, but that was my experience with the ones that I, I ran into. So the fund managers are making money, whether you make money or you lose money like this year. Most stocks are down, you know, 40, 50 percent, but the people managing the accounts are still making money. So that's not really the reason why I avoid stocks. The reason I avoid stocks is time. Right. When I started, I was making $17 an hour. I had a bunch of bad debt. I was raising three kids as a single dad. And I, I, I worked a bunch of overtime. I had a side hustle where I'm a total nerd. You can tell by that D and D map behind me. But I sold things. I played World of Warcraft and sold things online. Before that, it was EverQuest. Before that, it was uh, Ultima Online. So I'm literally an online gaming nerd who made money monetized the gaming because it kept me a, a hobby at the house to be around the kids. But I can actually generate money, and I was able to save around a thousand dollars a month in the beginning. If I went into stocks, if I started putting $1,000 a month in stocks to have the cash flow that I do now after 12 years of investing in real estate, it would take about $5 million in stocks to have the cash flow. Because in 2022, the cash flow that I, I had profit from real estate was 203000 of which I'm paying $0 in taxes. Another thing I avoid stocks for is because of the tax, the lack of tax benefits. But it would take about $5 million for the 4% rule to do that. So at $1,000 a month, uh, 5,000 months, 416 years, uh, it's a bit of time that I didn't really have. So, But if you have compound interest, I'd probably get it down to 100 years. So starting at 40, saving $1,000 a month, by 140, I'd be able to have the cash flow that I do now. Time didn't look attractive to me. That's including compound interest. There are people who make more. And like to invest in stocks for the return and maybe they use dividends or they have a, a the, the bucket method that joe coon uses where people who were retiring this year and all of a sudden we hit a bear market and and they, they're dipping into that first bucket which joe coon J K U H N has a great channel retired at 54 he's 58 now he's been retired four years talks about using stocks to retire totally respect the the method and it worked for him right but the people who are retiring this year are living in their first bucket, that cash bucket that hopefully the bear market doesn't last longer than the size of that bucket for you. Uh, his, I think, is three or four years. So three or four year bear market, which is longer than the average. Sure, he'll be fine. But the amount of money needed to be invested to get me the cash flow that I have now is exponentially so large, I wouldn't reach it in my lifetime. Uh the bucket method kind of feels like timing the market to me, hoping that a bear market doesn't last longer than your first bucket when you retire, which for the last 10 years, yeah, you're probably fine. But currently, the next five years, who knows, right? So the, the time needed to invest in stocks was the deal breaker for me. Another couple of things is lack of control. <clears throat> with, a, with the asset class that I chose with real estate, I can actually go and add a shed, increase the rent to $100. I can go and build a wall, turn a two-bedroom, uh, one bath, uh, side of a duplex into a three bedroom, one bath and add $500 a month to my rent. I can't call Amazon and direct them. I can't control what Elon tweets to say, this is what's going to happen to the stock of the company. So yeah, I don't have the control that I have in real estate. Not that you need it. You can, you can have a well diversified stock portfolio where you benefit from other people making good decisions, but you can also lose when they don't. I wanted that control. Uh, one of the main reasons I was able to reach financial freedom from such a bad position, you know, a lot of bad debt, not making a lot of money, raising three kids, <clears throat> Um, was house hacking, like the cheat code to wealth, like the literal reason why I was able to uh, make work optional in such a short period of time without making a lot of money was reducing or eliminating my largest expense. And I'm pretty sure you can't house hack Amazon stock or Tesla. There, there might be a version out there. I haven't found it. So you can't house hack a stock. Uh, I did house hack. I was paying $1,500 a month for an apartment, moved into a duplex, reduced my expenses from $1,500 a month down to $300 a month, adding $1,200 a month to my saving. When you're making $17 an hour, that's massive. The return on a rental in most markets is going to be somewhere between 5 to 10% for most average markets. You might be like the lumberjack landlord where Matt can get 25 30% with his systems in place, his ability to do rehabs and all of the things he puts into his deals. I'm super lazy, was working full-time, raising kids. I purchased cash-flowing properties, 
from the MLS using traditional lending. No burr, no flip, no seller financing, no wraps, no, no nothing creative. Literally just look on the MLS with several agents having auto searches for me. Found the deals, made the offers, found the properties. Uh, have the binder strategy. It's a lot easier to find cash flowing rentals off the MLS or from the MLS if you have a strategy that gets your tenants to ask you to raise the rent, right? So I can house hack um, by year three, the return on all of my rentals is over 20%, consistently 100%. So it's not like over a long enough timeline, the stock return averages 10%, right? But is that 10% nominal? Or does that factor in inflation, which is two to three percent most years, eight percent the last couple? Uh, so, and, and does it account for taxes? Are you paying taxes on that? Whereas with depreciation and write-offs, you make hundreds of thousands of dollars in profits on rentals every year without paying a penny in income tax. Now, my tenants pay a lot of property taxes, right? So that doesn't come out of me because that's taken out before I calculate my yield. So my profit isn't touched by taxes for decades. And by the time I get to the point where my depreciation schedules have run out, my write-offs don't compensate, and I don't have the write-offs of mortgages, I'll probably be paying taxes. And that will suck because I'll be making a half a million dollars a year in profit. I'll probably have to give some of it to the government, right? That sucks. So is it possible to retire with stocks? Yes. That's the traditional method that people do because they want you to work for 40 years, more than 40 hours a week for more than 40 years to retire in less than 40% of what you make. That's the normal wasn't going to work for me because I didn't actually understand finances at all until I was 40. It's like some of us have this day where we wake up and we go, okay, I'm going to take a look and see how money works. If you're lucky, it's when you're 15. If you're like me, um, you foolishly squander your money on food and heat and having a family and you don't pay attention to your finances and you actually make the stupid mistake of saying my spouse will handle all that because <laughs> that doesn't always work out. So at 40, being single, I finally took charge of it myself. And I figured the average person can reach financial freedom in 10 years or less, even if you're not starting from the best position and make work completely optional, which I did. It took eight years to go from that position of bad debt, low income, to financial freedom. Uh, financial independence happened in about eight years. I worked for four more years because I really liked my job. I was actually demoted all the way down to the president of that truck driving school and grew it from six staff to 60, one location to five. Like I was really enjoying the job. The time freedom was more important than growing a company for someone else. It is absolutely possible to retire without stocks. If I had money trapped in a retirement account, I'd still be working. If I own stocks, I'd still be working. So the last thing I'll wrap up with this live, which is going to be a nice long live where I answer as many questions as I can get to. Uh, sometimes I'll do a midday live random where I put the timer out here and you have 17 minutes for me to get the content out. And we're at 13 now, so I'd almost be coming up to the end of the house. Good timing. Uh, thanking my future self when I watch this later to see if I sounded as stupid as I thought I did. But <laughs> the last thing I'll wrap up with stocks is a lot of people, and even people I know in real life, like outside of YouTube University, where I interact with people and I say, here's why I'm 100% real estate. They go, oh, I wouldn't want that. I'd want to be diversified. So Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger are partners. They've been partners for decades. It took me forever to learn Charlie Munger's name. I have some memory issues, but Warren Buffett, I've, I must have heard it before I had the trauma. So Warren Buffett always talks about diversification. Kevin O'Leary, Mr. Wonderful, talks about no more than 20% in any asset class, no more than 5% in any one asset. So they, these are super wealthy people talking about being diversified. And one of the biggest mistakes most of us do is we get our advice from not wealthy people. We interact with the 99%, our parents, our teachers, our coworkers, people who aren't financially independent, work is optional, they don't have to work. So, so we listen to them and they say, the worst advice, right? We get the worst. So when we turn to the wealthy people, Charlie, uh, Warren Buffett, Kevin O'Leary, we think, oh, the, the super wealthy person is saying to be diversified, totally makes sense. Well, Charlie Munger came in with something that resonated with me and totally made sense. He said, that's stupid. Should have seen Warren Buffett's face during the because they were at a booth doing a presentation together. Uh, he said, you don't diversify to get wealthy. You don't have the bandwidth to learn stocks, retirement accounts, understand what a backdoor Roth is, a ladder, or whatever any of those words that I don't even want to know is. You don't even understand what depreciation is. There's several different types, right? I have a higher tax pro that makes sure I'm benefiting from it the way that I should. Um, so I don't want to learn those. I don't have the bandwidth to do that, but I know how to learn one asset class. So if I picked growing a business and I and I had entrepreneurial skills, I totally would be growing a business. If I picked stocks and I dedicated myself to watching thousands of hours in stock content, which is what you're getting when you watch my channel, 
thousands of hours of me watching real estate content filtered through an investor who reached financial freedom, right? If I focused on stocks, I'd probably be able to reach financial freedom in 10 to 30 years, like the normal path that most people take. I focused on real estate and I know how to get my tenants to ask me to raise the rent. I know how to keep it. My system's in place where I can self-manage 16 rentals, take less than two hours a month to do it, right? I, I focused on it and, and did that. If I was learning stocks and growing a business and trying to do real estate and trying to work a job and raise kids, I wouldn't have been successful at any one of them well enough to reach financial freedom. So diversifying while you're trying to reach financial freedom, I agree with Charlie, it's stupid. Pick an asset class and focus on it. Once you become wealthy, your net worth hits the four, seven, ten million dollars. Your cash flow is four or five times what it takes you to live your life because you focused on that asset class and you mastered it. You chased one rabbit because if you chase five rabbits in the beginning, you'll starve. Once you have a pen full of rabbits, you can go out and chase different things if you want. Diversify once you're wealthy totally makes sense. So once you have massive cash flow more than you need, your net worth is really high and you take a small percentage, 1% throw it at crypto, 5% throw it at stocks. If you're heavy into stocks, I still suggest house hacking, but maybe buy a rental like uh, Graham Stephan did. And he was trying to become a realtor, have uh, inconsistent income because he was super young. He'd go six months with no income and then have a large check come in and, and you know, he'd buy a fancy car and be broke and then have no income. So he bought some rentals like the wealthy people he was interacting with did so that he'd have some consistent income every month. And then he went on to do YouTube and invest in stocks and he grew different ways. But he became wealthy, financially free by picking one asset class and mastering it. The point of this video was you can retire early without owning any stocks. You can be diversified without owning any, any stocks. Here's how I diversified in real estate. The, the Cliff Notes version. I keep my rentals at least 10 miles apart so that I'm drawing tenants from multiple sources. I don't want all, I don't want a 10 plex. I want five duplexes. So I own seven properties with 16 units that are spread out more than 10 miles apart. So for one, they're like seven, it's a great deal. So I'll, I'll bend on my rules and, and, and lose something, not a lot of it, but I, if it, I want at least two or three economic drivers. So a bay support, a college, hospital, Boeing, Amazon, a beach, something that draws in people, large population. Um, I want to diversify the tenant base, right? If, if you went to 100% section eight and then the housing voucher program shuts down for six months, you're not gonna be in a good position. Or if a government shutdown lasts long enough for that to be impacted, you're not gonna be in a good position. So I do one third military, one third section eight, one third working or retired. I am very diversified in one asset class that I mastered to reach financial freedom and be able to walk away from a really good job that I liked because time freedom is amazing. Uh, I'm not telling you to pick real estate. I'm telling you, you can retire early by picking an asset class and mastering it. And that is possible to do it without any stocks. Uh, in 2020, if you were paying attention, when the CARES Act hit, you can actually take out up to $100,000 of a retirement account if you were impacted in any way by COVID. Luckily, we were shut down for a while, so we were impacted. I took my money out. I still contributed for the match because it makes sense to get that free money, right? It irritated me that I was locking money away, but it was free money. So I have about $11,000 in a retirement account, which this month I'm taking out because in 2023, I'm not going to have any W-2 income, so I'll be in the lowest tax bracket for earned income, uh, and I'll pay the 10% penalty. I don't care. Was it $1,100? I'll just burn it. It doesn't matter because the return I'm going to get on the nine, probably seven, five or six thousand dollars that's left after the government takes their share, the return I want to get on the worst case, say I get $5,000, so less than half. Within two or three years, I'll be getting a 20% return or better on a rental property with that money uh, consistently over the next few years that it would take me to get to 59 and a half, which is seven and a year and a half years away now. I'm 52. Uh, I will have more money than what is in that retirement account. I will have control. I will have cash flow from it now to actually live on. Um, so if you have a retirement account offered by your employer, get the match. I suggest that. But beyond that, anything above that should be invested in the asset class that you're trying to master to reach financial freedom. So let me see if I can get to these questions and see how everybody's doing here on this Saturday morning or on whatever day you're watching this in future land. Hello, future land. Howdy, Nathan. Uh, nice to see you here. All Nighter Hider. Howdy. Kip. Howdy. Good to see you. Uh, no control with stocks. Good point. All Nighter Hider. That's true. 
uh, you you do control where you you know like if you have a retirement account you could pick the asset classes or you know your what do they call it your structure 10 percent bond and you know the higher the younger you are the more risk you have like so it sounds like you have some control but you have a lot of control with real estate laser Howdy, laser-focused solutions. I have trapped money in 401k. Wish I knew years ago there were other vehicles like real estate rentals. Me too. But it's like I said, we all have this one day where we wake up and we go, okay, there's another way to do this. Oh, this is how money works. First, you have to realize it's not real. Once you realize money is not real, it becomes a lot easier to get a lot of it. Um, and the person working, making $15 an hour, barely making the money to buy food with their money, there's no way that person is usually going to see that money is not real. It, it tangibly turns into surviving right and that's a hard point to get out of and so I've had people leave comments saying the other day I did a short which I'm going to try to do a few more of uh, talking about poor people think money is for paying for things middle class think money is for leverage so you want a good credit score so you get a big house and a big car so people think you're living a big life and wealthy people understand money is to make more money and there were some comments where people said well of course if you're wealthy money is to make more money but if you're poor how do you do that well that's why I had to house hack. That's why I had to have a side hustle. That's why I had to work overtime. That's why I avoided bad debt. Like I didn't know the bad debt existed until I found out about it. But it's more important if you're poor to focus on generating your money, making money than if you're wealthy. Once you're wealthy, you can actually make some bad decisions. You can say, I've got 130 rentals, right? And I'm not saying the lumberjack landlord is going to do this, but he's got more than 130. You could say, I'm going to buy that rental in that town over there and gamble on appreciation it's not going to cash flow probably going to lose some money who's going to care who cares if that's what you do right because it's such a small part of your portfolio the wealthy person can actually look at money like it's not real and do stupid things the poor person shouldn't they should do something where they have control they have a plan and they stay focused um, so with the 401k if you have money trapped in there um, i don't recommend taking it out like i did and putting it to work in a rental, especially on your first couple of deals. That first one, two, maybe even three rentals is when we tend to make our biggest mistakes. We buy alligators. We have bigger expenses than we anticipated. We don't know how to calculate rents, right? Like all these problems can happen. I lost money my first year owning a rental. So I wouldn't want to put your retirement account at risk while you're learning the basics. Once you have your strategies down, um, I support emptying out retirement accounts and putting it to work in a, in a, in a rental. I do not support self-directed ret retirement accounts where you can buy a rental with it in it because you lose all the benefits of owning real estate. You can't self-manage depreciation. Like all these things, the reasons why you want, I want to invest in real estate aren't ju are just not there. Um, there is a use for your 401k while the money's trapped in there, like you said. And that is when you go to buy your re real estate, your, your next rental property, lenders will recognize 50% of a retirement account as a reserve. So one of the challenges we have when we buy a rental property is you need to have money. I mean, it takes money to make money. Nobody ever says it doesn't have to be your money. So there are ways to invest with little or no of your own money, finding a partner, <clears throat> you know, using hard money to do a burr, like all these creative strategies that I don't do. I save the money buy the property, add the cash flow to saving the money to buy the property, rinse and repeat, super slow, super boring in the first five years, but the next five years were hard to keep up with. Um, so you have to save the down payment, the money for closing costs, the money for immediate repairs, even the rent ready or already occupied properties that I prefer to buy have something small that needs to be done. I, I had to purchase one property that needed a roof. So I went into it knowing that cost to acquire was going to include buying a roof replacement. Um, and reserves. The lender is going to say you need, you know, down payment, closing costs, immediate repairs, and reserves. You have to have money sitting there. Some confusing lenders will say you only want four percent of your net worth, so you need to figure out what your net worth is, <laughs> or no, four percent of your yeah, it was your net worth. Other lenders will say we want you to have three months or six months of your principal, interest, taxes, and insurance, so your your mortgage payments of all of the properties you own, primary house, rentals, doesn't matter. All of them lumped together, you have to have three months in an account. Well. Saving all of that money might take you longer. I mean, it's the best way to do it. You want the reserves to, for the emergencies that are going to pop up, right? But I had um, a retirement account. I had $17,000 in credit cards I hadn't tapped. Um, I had cash flow from a good job. I had cash flow from real estate. When I purchased my fourplex, I dropped down to having $200 in my bank account. So 12 years ago, making $17 an hour. Never having a thousand dollars in my in my account, I got up to having a, like one hundred and forty one thousand dollars in the bank. Most money I'd ever seen. Seems like a life savings to somebody. And now that seems like a 
uh, I'll probably make that next year that I might, I might not spend, right? Like that's, that's such a different version for life for me now, uh, which I'm trying to get all of you to that same point. But I purchased the fourplex, did the down payment, did the closing cost, did the immediate repairs, put a roof on it, and I had $200 left. Lender would never do that. So we used my retirement account, 50% of it counted as the reserve. So the lender was like, okay, you don't have to tap it, touch it, take it out. You have to prove that it's there. It had to prove that it was... Um, seasoned and been in there and you know, had a known source. Uh, so that's one use that you might have for your 401k where you locked that money up. Um, and the reason I did this is because I was going to get the cash flow from the real the, the property the month I closed. I closed on the sixth of the month. So I got the rent from that minus six days, five days. Um, and then I got the month, the, the income for the next month because there's a month where you skip your mortgage. So just from that property, I had about $10,000 back into reserve account. Uh, plus, I was saving 100% of my W-2 income and about 60% of rental income. So it was really easy for me to do that. That's why I don't suggest doing that in the beginning, right? When, you, when you're going to make your mistakes. Once you have four or five deals down, you have a con you have confidence in your ability to get your return. You know what the timeline is like. You know what to expect. I want to say it's it's okay to be more risky. I want to say it's it's but it's easier to know your your tolerance at that point. Phil, howdy. We still need to make a call. Reach out. Okay, stocks are very unstable. That's where a lot of people talk about over a long enough timeline. If you if you compress what looking at the real estate market, it looks like it kind of does what stocks do too. So it's it's slower, it's stickier. You can have times where it crashes, like in 2008, but who, who benefited in 2009? Long-term buy and hold investors. First, rents didn't dip unless you were in class A, really, really high-end rentals, which I don't suggest investing in. I like class B or C because there's more demand in economic downturns. Uh, so actually rents went up in 2009 10, and 10 in my area. And then they've historically not ever gone down since we've started tracking the data, right? So you benefit in bad times by being a long-term buy and hold investor, and you can buy more because the prices went down. When stocks crash with dollar cost averaging, yes, you're going to buy more stocks, but imagine the, most, the emotional roller coaster of right, right now, my net worth, I'm trying to think, uh, which is not a number that I would care about or know, but I was, I've made videos on net worth. Like when did I get a million dollars in debt, a million dollars in net worth, which one happened first? Um, they actually happened in the same transaction on the same day. So chicken or egg was an omelet with chicken in it. So stupid screen popped up, wants me to put an ad in. I don't do that. Um, real estate can seem unstable if you're uneducated. If you're trying to do a burr and you're heavily reliant on interest rates staying where they're at and prices staying where they're at are increasing, instability is a thing. So don't start with the burr method. Same thing. I would do what Millennial Mike did. Get eight to 10 rentals, have a, a portfolio in place, have, have confidence in your job because right now nobody wants to work in law enforcement. So there's pretty good job security. Um, and then do some burrs to where... He purchased them when interest rates were 3%, and then they doubled up into the 6% range, right? So, so the burr he had planned didn't work, but he was able to handle it. Still walked away with a successful burr, but if it was his first deal, I don't know that it would have worked out as well as he now knew. Here's how long it takes to do a rehab. Here's the rents I can actually expect. Here's how my property management is going to work. Like he had the, the skill set to, to do it successfully. If you're a flipper and you've been watching flipping shows for the last 10 years in an uptrending market, where a mistake added a delay, people look like a genius if they made mistakes because a couple months later, it was worth more. The market compensated for the mistake. Are you confident that the market is going to continue to uptrend when 80% of people are expecting it to go down? Um, the lumberjack landlord expects 5 to 10% uh, drop in, in home prices. Still not enough to delay buying. Buying now, getting the yield between now and then, having the pay down uh, and the tax benefits and starting the depreciation cycle is more beneficial than waiting for a 5 or 10% drop. If it was a 50% drop, I'd be on the thing saying, hey, this, this is the thing that's going to cause a drop. You should all wait to buy, right? That, don't take that clip out and play it out of context because that's not what I'm saying. Zuber says, expects it to be flat. He expects prices to stay the same. I believe in inflation. And I think that we printed more money in the last two years than the last 200. And inflation is going to cause assets to take more currency to purchase. So it's not a supply and demand issue. Supply and demand are going up and down at the same time with in housing. 
it's interest rate driven driven it's supply chain issue driven it's we built less properties in the last 10 years than we did in the last several decades um, each decade by themselves but there's all these things that make supply and demand go up and down at the same time i think inflation is going to cause prices to go up and it doesn't matter if it goes up 10 percent or down 10 percent. i'm still buying right now i'm still hunting for the next deal so i agree with you kip they, they are unstable and they, they peak and trough a lot faster than real estate do, does um and okay howdy just found alive we got phil and all that are talking about where to meet up awesome bobby howdy laura good morning howdy hopefully you're doing having a good saturday here <laughs> can't control where the snow pusher pushes i didn't find out was was he snow plowing his own or did he get hit by someone else's? You're at your double hacked quad. Can't wait for our chat. Me too. Looking forward to it. All Nighter Hider, investing in stocks isn't as productive as providing housing. Have you heard of the anti work thread and how much they attack landlords and that we're not providing housing because? You know, every home buyer wants to go out and buy a duplex or a fourplex, right? Or a house with an ADU or all, all of those asset classes that aren't intended for home buyers. They're invented, they're intended for people who don't want to own because not everybody does. Some people want to be more fluid, able to move, uh, don't want to have to have the large repair of fixing the roof. A lot of people who own real estate have rental properties, rent where they live. Kind of like you never want to drive in a mechanic's car. Right. They, they can do really good work on someone else's car. Their car is falling apart and it's a death trap. The landlord who fixes things at their tenant's properties, has systems in place to do that, is less likely to fix things at their own place. So if they rent, they call and they say, hey, you, landlord, have an issue. And this is a point where for me to remind everybody, um, I encourage you to put questions into the chat. I will put my email in a comment after the video if you have questions because you're watching this in future land and you can't make the lives or you don't get notifications because YouTube sucks at that. Uh, if you email me questions, I will cover them either in a standalone video or I will cover them in a live stream. Bill O'Connell, first order of business, hit the like button. Every time you hit the like button, an angel gets its wings. Uh, chat moved, which is awesome because that means there's questions coming. I appreciate that. Uh, howdy, Matt. Marina, howdy. Good morning. So I'm trying to figure out when to do random lives. I um, have been doing lives with the Lumberjack Landlord on Fridays, but he was traveling back from Vegas yesterday. Uh, so we missed yesterday. I figured I'd do it today. Saturday was always one rental at a time. Zuber's live. He would do it at eight. Um, at eight o'clock, I'm still waking up. So, so I'm not doing that. Um, that's the one thing that's, that's what there's three things that you find out in, re in retirement that I'm going to be covering in a video soon. And one of them is you get to find out what kind of person you are. I would have told everybody for the last 30 years, I'm a morning person. I've always had jobs that started, had some jobs that started at 10 at night, and then you worked until noon the next day, right? So 14 hour days. But I had a lot that started at five or seven in the morning. In the last decade, running a truck driving school, where we started training students at six in the morning and we worked until midnight. So we had two shifts. I'd be there at five because from five to six was my time to make sure everything started right. And all the issues that, you know, fires need to put out, I could put out before the day started. So students would show up and see a little less chaos than what the instructors see behind the closed door, right? I wasn't a morning person. I had a morning schedule. I don't function until one or two in the afternoon because I find it almost impossible now that I don't have an alarm clock or a set schedule. I find it almost impossible to go to sleep before midnight. But there's something going on between five at night and midnight somewhere that I'm going to be involved in. And I never would have said that about myself. So uh, random midday live streams are going to be nine o'clock or later. <laughs> and the Tuesday ones I'm continuing to do. Um, I might move the time 
because it's overlapping with Sachs Realty. And he has a good YouTube channel, great content, great information. Um, and I don't want to take viewers away from him and on because I started an hour before him. I also don't want to see the viewers drop at an hour when his live pops up. So I have to work that out. I might do a poll and figure out what people want. Warren Munger and Charlie Buffett. That's probably what almost came out of my mouth. I'm not, I'll have to watch it later and see if I actually said that. Phil Neely, you are the five people you spend the most time around. All Nighter Hider, I have invested in uranium and nothing happened. Still waiting. And in the meantime, REI, it is. So Matt, Mark Matsky from Matsky Finance invests in oil and a couple of other things too. So he's diversified, but he acquired a bunch of rentals and then diversified. Uh, so it might be a great thing. I don't know that I would diversify into those things before owning like uh, a couple ounces of gold, some silver, right? Have that, but that's not an investment. It's, it's kind of a conversation maker more than anything else. Um, zombie apocalypse planning, right? But not like an investment strategy. Duchess, howdy, Section 8 disappearing, there would be riots. Well, it's not so much that it could disappear. It's that, it, so the, I think the longest government shutdown I remember was like 68 or 69 days. Uh, and Section 8 wasn't impacted. But it can impact military paychecks. It can impact Section 8, maybe a month or two delay. If you're 100% Section 8, and you don't have enough reserves to handle that delay, that's not a position I would want to be in. Also, Section 8 sometimes can lag. The last couple of years, they were, you know, 20 to 30 percent below area average. So having more than a third of your portfolio in that for stability could be costing you a lot of money. If you go to the website that Lumberjack, Lumberjack Landlord shared, where it shows what they're going to pay per county per year projected for 2023, and I think 2024, uh, they're actually catching up quite a bit this year because they base it off of the last five years data. And in 2021, rents went up like 40%. It wasn't like, oh, we're going to do a 5 or 10%. My tenants asked me to raise the rent 20 to 28%. So if a requested rent increase was over 20%, the actual rent increase that landlords did and didn't care about turnover uh, was more than that. Now the HUD is using it, the housing authority is using that information to set rents. Um, so I still think diversification, you might be comfortable 100% in Section 8 or... Lumberjack landlord was 0% in Section 8, and he has had some headaches. And there are some reasons why certain counties, that I, I invest in two counties. My Section 8 tenants that are, are in one county, I will not invest in it in the other. The housing authority might tell you it's a good or bad investment in your area, too. John, Texas. Howdy. How's the search for the $1 million property going? It's, it's hit or miss. Uh, I have made some offers. I haven't seriously looked because I'm not trying to add units. Like the million dollar search of, so here's the chronology. Sorry, my voice apparently lasts exactly 38 minutes. Um, I would like to thank the sponsor of today's video, Skull Vodka, who obviously doesn't sponsor my videos. <laughs> they just make them possible. I started looking for a million dollar property at the beginning of 2022. Uh, I had saved uh, like $250,000. So I had the 25% down. I was starting to save the reserve. So I was looking for the property, found a couple made offers. I uh, was planning on working for another three or four years, at least, if not another decade, right? Um, I actually wasn't paying attention to the cash flow of the rent increases. And there's a video coming out on that too, because uh, somebody sent me an email and I'm gonna give them credit in it, or it might've been a message on the impact of a small rent increase. So if you've been watching my content, you'll get the Cliff Notes version here. I talk about the hidden cost of property management, that if you're paying 10% to property management, they're probably taking about 50% of your, your gains, right? If you have $2,000 in rents coming in and your mortgage going is, is 1,300, so you have $700 a month coming in, you're paying 10% to your property management. So setting aside for repairs, maintenance and vacancy would be uh, three or $400, so we'll say 300. So 13 plus three, it's $1,600 is going out. So you're setting aside the mortgage, repairs, maintenance, and vacancy of 300 might be a little bit more. Now this is loose math because I haven't done the video yet. So don't hold me to this whiteboard that I'm not doing. You have $400 left. Well, 10% of 2,000 is 200. 200 is going to the property market. They're making half of what you could make. So, so they're getting paid as much as you to take all the risk and on them, save the down payment and buy the property, right? So that's one of the reasons why I self-manage. 
I want to double my profit. Well, a 10% rent increase can add 50% to your profit. And I wasn't really tracking that. The binder strategy in 2021 that hit 20 to 28% of my, my rents took me from a projected, uh, so I made 128,000 in 2021. I thought I was going to make 168,000 in 2022 and ended up profiting 203 plus like 30 something thousand dollars into the reserve account. Um, actually felt pretty stupid going to work, right? Then the money just, the income, the income snowball is a thing. And even the person doing it might not recognize it until it happens. So I was searching for that million dollar property. And then I realized 16 rentals might be more than I want, right? It's two hours a month, sometimes a little more, sometimes it's nothing. Like <clears throat> the 30 minutes to go into the different uh, accounts to make sure the rent was paid to manage my properties. Do I want to add more? So I'm still kind of looking. The money's piling up, right? The income snowball is still happening. Um, I don't know if it's going to be another fourplex or if I'm finally getting to the point where I want to diversify. I don't know. So that's how it's going. I haven't really been hunting. Um, Michael Zuber would be disappointed because you want to do the work. But remember, don't compare year 10 or year 12 to year one. In growth, growth mode, it was every day. Every email that came in from my agents was like a scratch lottery ticket. I opened it up wondering if this is going to be the email that adds to my cash flow. So it's not that that property isn't there. I've probably missed a few of them. All Nighter Hunter, I would love to see a chart of how many people have reached financial freedom with stocks versus real estate. Oh, so real estate is the asset class that creates the most millionaires. I would think stocks would be far a, a far greater number of people reaching financial freedom with stocks than with real estate because 90% of realtors, real estate agents who work with investors never own one rental. The average person is working for a pension or a retirement. So social security plus a retirement and a very frugal life means financial freedom when you're 80, right? That, that number is going to be huge. I would want to know how many people did it in 10 years or less. If you invest in stocks, can you reach financial freedom in 10 years? Yes. You, you hit the right stock. Sure. You, you invest uh, using the cat that walks on the keyboard. Maybe. Right. Remember, the highest performing stock portfolios belonged to people who died. The second highest performing stock portfolios belonged to people who forgot they had them. And then in 2013, the study was done with a cat named Orlando, where they literally watched the cat walk on the keyboard, invested in the, the what the cat walked on. And that outperformed most investing firms. So is it possible? Yes. Likely. I don't know. But if you educate yourself on real estate and you save and invest the down payment, you don't do the risky things like burr and flipping and those kind of things in the beginning. Wait till you have the strategies down to actually do this. The likelihood of success is much higher. And thank you for the hit the like button, Bill. I appreciate that. I think I saw a super chat. There we go. And I missed it. There we go. When you Mike, good morning. Why are you not on here? You owe me a debate. Trash talking my rentals. <laughs> I messaged you first and I said, I am doing a video with, with Mike. And I, first of all, I want to mention your channel when I'm on there. I don't know if you've catch, caught on to this, but I'm trying to do everything with Millennial Mike. And everybody's like, oh, that's really cool. You're, you're partnering with Mike. Well, no, he's just smarter than me. And I'm gonna, I want to learn from Millennial Mike. Uh, and by doing that, so I, I mentioned your thing on it. So I came up with the topic of the video on one rental at a time was you can go broke buying cheap. So if you're going to invest in Gary, Indiana, because it's cheap, you're going to go broke. If you're Millennium Mike and you're going to invest in Gary, Indiana, because you know Mark Matsky, he invests there. You watch him for months. You bat, you piggyback on his systems to find the property management, the, the areas to avoid, all that, and you buy the rentals. That's a brilliant strategy. So it sounds like I was attacking you there. I'm happy to debate, though. I'd love to make that video. Laser focused solutions. I love the short. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, for a, quite a long time, I avoided shorts. Um, he doesn't watch this content, so I can talk about it here. Um, my son has has the millennial attention span, right? I don't know that he's ever watched a movie. I, I talk about a movie that I like, and he'll go out and watch the screen rant pitch meeting and go, yep, I watched the movie too, because it was five minutes long. 
Um, so getting him to absorb content is, is very difficult. So he'll watch my 10 minute videos or less, but he won't watch anything more than 10 minutes. Uh, he'll talk to me, but the conversation has to be less than 10 minutes long too. Um, so he's always wanted me to do shorts because he watches shorts all day long. Millennial Mike pointed out that this is the way people are learning. So I've been hesitant because I, I'm not, I don't know, I'm not trying to monetize my channel. I'm not trying to make a bunch of money. I'm probably going to have sponsors because I'm not stupid. I'm not going to turn down money, right? I don't want to sell hours. I'll give hours away on, on like, you know, roll the dice or whatever. That's why I set it at $5,000 an hour. If you want an hour of time, it costs $5,000 because nobody's going to do that. So I don't have to create another job, but I can still give away the time. The shorts content, I was looking at what can you learn in a short? So I didn't want to make them. But that I was looking at it wrong. I was, what can you say in a short that can get someone's attention and give a concept? And then the person will want to figure out the concept and do a deeper delve. So stand by to see more shorts. And I think I'm going to try for like 20 second shorts, not minute long shorts. I don't want to do, you know, Zuber's got a good team where they, they go into the long videos like this. They take a good sound bite. They take a minute. They make a short. I mean, literally like five to 30 second. Here's a thought. Have you ever thought of this? see how they do they doing pretty good so far samik howdy i follow your videos a lot and learn a lot thanks a lot for contribution howdy from india howdy i um i don't know what part of india you're from i watch a channel called minority mindset with jaspeet singh who's from india and i've actually learned a lot about india i think because you know i'm in america and they don't teach us anything in school from watching his content like I didn't understand anything about the Sikh religion. I didn't understand about the last name thing. I didn't understand like all kinds of things while I'm learning about finances. I'm also learning about that culture there. So that's really cool. And there was one study where they were talking about first generation billionaires where, you know, um, the millionaire next door does, does a study of 10,000 people or whatever. And it's like close to 80% of millionaires are self-made. So like, you know, 12 to 18 uh, percent inherit <clears throat> and, they, and they went through all these countries where, you know, the first made first generation and India was like at the top of the, 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 the most billionaires being self-made of all of these other countries. I thought that was interesting. John, Texas, how much was the cash flow on your first rental property and how much is it now? That was a great question. I did a video the other day. Um, I think it was a live stream last week. Have I mentioned memory issues? But uh, talking about the first 10 years, here was the cash flow. Here's in, in, in first year, second year, third year, fourth year. So I did one with Matt, the lumberjack landlord, and Michael Zuber too, one rental at a time where we talked about that. You probably do that with Millennium Mike too. Just do that video. What's the first 10 years like? Because you're still in the first 10 years. First year rental property, um, I saved $12,000 um, because I was working a ton of overtime. I wasn't making a lot. I was making like $17 an hour. By the end of the year, it was probably like 18 maybe. Um, I know by the end of year two, it was 19. So I started to make more money there. Not a lot, but it was a lot of overtime. I was selling things on World of Warcraft, making like 300 bucks a month. So 700 from my job, 300, I was saving about a thousand dollars a month. So I saved $12,000. At the end of the year, I had $6,000 because I lost six grand my first year owning my rental. I did everything wrong. I wasn't edu educated. I figured who can trust a stranger? That's weird. So I'm going to rent to a friend. Brilliant. Uh, who would have a lease with a friend? That's that's putting a contract into a relationship. That's just weird. So we didn't, we didn't even do a handshake. We just kind of said, hey, you move in, this will be the rent. I didn't set the rent at a profitable amount. Uh, like the, the mortgage was 1,088. I think the rent was 1,000 or 1,050. I have to go and look. So I wasn't counting for CapEx or vacancy, right? I was just going to lose money on this rental, but I was trying to figure out how to be a landlord. Going to replace my income no education whatsoever. Hadn't read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, or listened. Uh, didn't find bigger pockets. Didn't find one rental at a time. Like it's just absolutely doing everything wrong. Lost so much money. Went to the house because the guy stopped paying rent. Want to had the face-to-face -face conversation and found out he didn't live there. <laughs> he had moved out, rented the house to someone else, was collecting rent, but not paying me. And in his mind, that was a separate transaction. So it wasn't fraud. Uh, I was just stupid. So I tried to quit. I tried to give the house away. Um, I owed 138,000 um, houses were going for about a hundred thousand because it was 2009, 2010 housing crash had happened. It was underwater. Couldn't give it away. Almost did a subject to found somebody who could take it, but something changed in their situation to where they couldn't qualify because you had to make 12 payments 
And then, and then someone passed away in their family and they inherited a house, so they moved out. So then I educated myself. So the first year, I lost six grand. The next year, I made about 400 bucks a month. Uh, rent went to, so it was 1,088 for the mortgage. I remember that number. Um, rent went to like, at the end of the year, 1,400. But by the end, so at the end of the first year, it was 1,400. And then by the end of the second year, I did the binder strategy and actually started making money. That was when I figured out, oh, you show the tenant what the rents are and they'll ask for the rent to go up. Why isn't everybody doing this? Uh, so evolution of the binder strategy. So that's what it looked like. First year, lost money. Second year, made about 400 bucks a month. Um, currently, it's paid off. Right? It was my lowest uh, amount owed on the property with the highest interest rate. It was above 6%. So at the point in 2015, you were allowed to have four mortgages in your name. So I got to four, focused and paid it off. Would not do that now. That was a mistake. Um, I didn't know about asset-based lending, DSCR. Um, I didn't know about all these other things, about seller financing. So I, I wouldn't have paid off the mortgage, but I did. So it is currently paid off. Rents it to Section 8 tenant at 2200 a month. Uh, 200 because it's in a county with really low taxes. So taxes and insurance, 200 I set aside 200 for maintenance and repair. So it's making about 1800 a month, maybe a little less if I did vacancy in there too, but I've never had a vacancy. <clears throat> and the reserve account is full. That's just money I add towards the investing account anyways, anyway. Um, so that's what the first rental currently looks like. It's the only single family that I own. I own another single family house, but it's on a property with a duplex. So it's, I call it my triplex. I'm not sure which one is the ADU, but that's really my only single family, which I have never seen another single family that would cash flow in my area uh, by itself. I only have that because I owned it before I was an investor. I purchased it in like 99 for, um, I was the cause of the 2008 housing crash. I bought it for 98,000, wrapped up 4,000 in closing costs. It was a $102,000 mortgage on a house that quickly appreciated, uh, refinanced to an adjustable rate mortgage around 2003 to pay my ex her portion of equity before I found out about the $89,000 in debt in my name that I know about. Why does my voice go away every time I talk about that? <clears throat> so now I owed 150,000 on a house around 2005. When 2008, I had paid it down to 138 and then the housing crash happened. It was now worth 100. So in 2009, it was worth what I paid in 2000, but I owed what I refinanced in 2003. So that's a confusing chronology there. It should have been done on a whiteboard. Sorry. Uh, I only own that house because I couldn't sell it. And I don't know that I would, I would have ever bought any other rentals if I was able to get rid of that house at that point in time. So there's my version of luck. That's one time where luck, preparation didn't meet opportunity, which is the definition of luck that most people use. That was, I couldn't sell it. I was stuck with it. I had to figure it out. Asilio, howdy. Do you have any recommendations to lower my taxable income through real estate? Um, so 12 years now, making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year in, in profit and still not paying a penny in, in rental income tax. So you have depreciation. Um, and write-offs. If you've owned a property long enough, the depreciation schedule only lasts 27 and a half years. If you did a cost segregation study and you took 25% of your depreciation immediately first year, now you only have 75% of depreciation left for the remainder of that schedule. So you might have a tax obligation. So what are your write-offs? And your question with taxes, not is this a write-off? The right question is, how do I make this a write-off? If you take a trip to Vegas, did you go and look at neighborhoods? Did you talk to a realtor? Did you go have meals with other investors to educate yourself? Did you do things that could turn almost that entire trip? Maybe not going and seeing Ka and Awakening. Unless you took a client, that's not going to be a write-off. But the meal, before and after, could be, depending on who you ate with. Um, how can I make this a write-off? So that's what I would do with that. I would not go and get a mortgage so that I can have a an interest payment so that I'm not paying taxes because you're going to pay $1,000 in interest to avoid $300 in taxes. That's stupid. If you have a mortgage because that's how you acquire the property, make sure you're benefiting from that. But here's my real advice for anybody who owns a rental, even just one. You get that first rental closed, you hire a tax professional. You have the bandwidth to learn real estate and, and to get better at that asset class. Uh, the thousands and thousands of pages of the tax code. I don't even want to know how a cost segregation study works. I don't want to know how the, is it bonus, amortized, scheduled, depreciation. I want to know what any of that means. I want to know that I have a tax pro who's doing the best I can to avoid 
not evade, but avoid taxes that you don't that you aren't required to pay. So if you're paying income on rentals, rental income, you're you're two things are happening. One, you're either doing your taxes wrong, or two, you're making so much money that you're going to have a tax obligation. That's not a bad thing. Right. A lot of people say, oh, I don't want to pay taxes. I would love for my profit to be so much that the depreciation and write offs didn't cover it to where I actually had a tax obligation. Um, but if you look, for the first decade, that's actually pretty rare to, to, to make enough money to where you don't have taxes because depreciation and write offs actually hit that. Uh, you can, <clears throat> not so much on the taxable income, but you can go to the county tax assessor and try to get your property taxes adjusted, depending on how that compares to other uh, taxes in the area. Um, my brother has done that successfully a couple of times, but it was at a time where it actually made sense. And uh, I'm not saying that's always going to work. It is not something that I have done. All Nighter Hider, sacrifice to provide opportunity is a worthy sacrifice. Basilio, I like that all night. Uh, Basilio, I have been investing in real estate, but paying a lot in taxes since I have a W-2 job. So you did, so that's the separation. Okay. And I'm passive real estate investor. So we were in the same boat. I paid a crap ton of taxes from my W-2 job. Um, it's If you work in real estate more than 751 hours, 751 or more hours, and you work in real estate more than you do your W-2 job, you might qualify as a real estate professional where you can take your real estate losses and apply that to your W-2. Every CPA that I've ever talked to says anytime that there's an audit and somebody has a W-2 job, that doesn't qualify. You don't meet the standard of a real estate professional. So you can maybe not get audited. It'll work, right? But if you get audited, you're going to be paying the taxes as though that didn't happen. Lumberjack landlord has has it worked out where his spouse, after she no longer had a W-2, works as a real estate professional, and then they can do it to impact his W-2. So now it makes sense. And then cost segregation studies can actually take more depreciation in one year and use it against your W-2. So if you work, if you somehow, you, you're, you or your spouse doesn't work and qualifies as a real estate professional, now you have different options where it can work better. Um, but the cash flow quadrant, Right, you E S B I. The reason we're trying to move from E to I is because the employee pays about forty percent in taxes. When you look at taxes, union, SSI, L and I, like all the different taxes that, that are going to come out, it's around forty percent. The employers even pay more, and then the, the self-employed person that owns their own job, right, the small business owner, pays the employee side and the employer side, so they're around sixty percent. The business side with capital gains pays around twenty percent, and then the investor we usually pay about zero. So the goal is for you to invest in real estate. This is what I did. I invested in real estate to the point where the W two wasn't needed, so I stopped working the W two, and now I'm not paying any taxes. Zero taxes for 2023, probably. 2022, I worked for about six months. So yeah, I'm going to actually write a check to the government for taxes for that employment because it wasn't income from real estate. The 203000 was real estate only. I won't pay any taxes on it. W-2 income was separate. That I'm going to pay taxes on. I see a super chat from Laura. Howdy. I appreciate that very much. Thanks so much for sharing your knowledge. My finances have improved because of you, question to follow. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think you've used the binder strategy and you were house hacking. Like there's like a couple strategies going on there. And then Laura put in a message that took it back to make me lose sleep and wonder forever and remember what it was. Here it is. Since I couldn't find a great deal, I decided to listen to you and house hack. Awesome. What a life change. It was like adding another unit with zero down. Nice. And I'm looking to make sure that there wasn't a question, or if there is, I will keep checking because you said you had a question. Yeah, it's it's hard to explain the benefits of house hacking because there's several versions of it. First, there's people like, oh, I don't want to share living space, so don't rent my other rooms like, like Tall Bottom does. Or I have kids. Well, my kids were my motivation to house hack, not my limiting factor. So I bought a duplex with fenced yards, garages in the middle. We're literally separated from the neighbors. The only thing touching was our garage wall. Um, and people are like, oh, I can't even stand that because whatever, house with an ADU, separated by different driveways, fenced off completely. Like you're not even going to interact and, and you're going to live in an area where there's no neighbors at all. That's the same thing. Or let's say you don't want a house hack at all and share space with someone else in any way whatsoever, not even a house with an ADU. 
So you purchase a property owner occupied for the low down payment and best interest rate. You live there for a year, rinse and repeat. You are house hacking, turning your primary residence into a rental without shared living space. Find somewhere on that spectrum that you fit to incorporate that into your investing rap rapidly. I could speak, words are hard. Rapidly speed up your timeline. And Laura took back a message again. I'll keep waiting. I know you're going to get it in there. <laughs> I will come back for your question, Laura. Um, Matthew Paris, howdy, another live with no notifications, do better YouTube. I'm not sure why. I have the same. Do you have a do you have an Apple device? I found out that that's kind of the issue with the people trying to find the, the, the join button for you know, the, the members only live streams that happen on Fridays, uh, you know, like at least twice a month. Uh, on Apple devices, the join button doesn't show up. So you have to go onto your laptop or your Mac. It'll, it'll work on the website, but it won't work in the app. So if Laura has a question here. Nope, still took it back. Okay. And I will try to get to all of the questions. Let me see where I was at here. All letter header. So how do you invest wealth? Oculus, Mike, how do you? All letter header. Question, how might a lender look at physical gold held in my possession as a reserve, not sure how I would verify that without introducing a third party. Ooh, good question. Okay, so one of the reasons I like the live is because you get to find out what an, an investor keeps in top of mind awareness. So if it's something like this where I'd have to go and research, um, I don't have enough gold for it to be a consideration. I do know that lenders would look at paper gold, 50% of that, easier than they're gonna look at for, um, real gold, physical gold, without a third party, like you said. Um, so that's a good question. The the paper gold where you're basically buying the looks like a stock and it says you own this much gold, it's not the way I uh, say to invest in gold, but lenders might look at that and go, okay, so that after cost of sale, after spot moving, you're going to have 50% like a reserve uh, retirement account. Uh, you pay taxes on capital gains after how long you've owned the asset. That's how I would look at that. The physical gold, you'd have to figure out how the third party, how they verify. Um, one of the main reasons that I don't buy gold is where is the trusted verifiable source of getting not diluted actual real gold? So, and I'm not saying, oh, you want to go buy like five ounces and there goes right at $10,000 or 9,400, depending on what spot was currently, right? So, sure, that's how But you want to take $150,000 and buy gold and it not be real? Um, that's why it's not the asset class that I choose. A store of money or so the zombie apocalypse version of, go, of, of owning gold, I like to own 10th ounces. So they look like a dime. Um, last spot I looked, they were like $160. So it's more per 10th ounce than it will for the ounce. And it's something you could trade and barter with without having to use an entire ounce of gold. Um, but if we're using gold for bartering, we have more problems. Like... Uh, Ammunition is probably more important. But Rob, you need a third party to use gold as a reserve. Jonathan, howdy. Shred, howdy. Oh, I had a question. Do you know how the lenders in our circle, Velocity Convoy, Emerge, look at Bitcoin for a reserve that is verifiable on the chain? <clears throat> no, that's a great question for Matt, the mortgage guy. That's actually probably one that we should do a video on. Uh, I am not in the crypto realm. I actually try not to say the word Bitcoin on my channel because these, these uh, what do they call them, scrubbers are out there and then all of a sudden you start getting the Bitcoin porn in the chat. Even if you have it set, like like if you're new to my channel, you saw one of the shorts and you, you're checking out my live first, amazing that you're here this long or unless you just found out about it because you didn't get the notification. Um, I have it set to where only subscribers can leave a comment because once you have a live and you start getting, you know, this many people that hang out during a live, you get a ton of bots in the comments and it's really hard to filter out. <clears throat> so let me see. Laura doesn't have a question in here. Still waiting. Um, yeah, so, so I'm not a crypto investor. Again, not that it's not a good asset class. 
I am not versed in it. And, and you pick your asset and you focus and you study and you master it. At some point, like even Zuber took like 1% of his portfolio and bought some crypto, put it in the account. Um, don't hold it on the, the trading platforms that keep going under. Um, not my asset choice. Same thing with stocks and business. Although I do own parts of some businesses. I have to look and see how they're doing. Jason, howdy. I have the money to buy a multifamily. I'm brand new. I'm worried about buying something that ends up not being a good deal. I'm in Chicago. I need to learn more. Where should I start? Thank you. So you're in Chicago. Um, to start on my channel, I've got the, the six steps to starting in, in real estate or how to retire early with real estate. The, there's a couple things you can be doing right now, Jason, and it isn't buy a deal. Because I agree with you. If you just went out and bought a deal, you, you'd probably buy a bad one and you're going to lose money and you don't want to do that. Even break even, you don't want to do that. A couple of things that you can be doing right now. First, learn how to save. And it sounds silly when somebody says learn how to save because you just think, oh, you don't spend as much, right? No. To learn how to save means increase your income. That can be overtime, side hustle, change companies. You're more likely to get a 10 to 20% pay increase by changing companies where you're going to get a 5 to 7% cost of living increase if you stay at the one you're at. So if you're closer to my age, most people think there is reward in longevity and employment. And if you're younger than me, you realize that people are making more money because they change companies. So first, increase your income. And that might be do something like go out and get a certificate or a license in some trade. You know, an average truck driver now starting out over $80,000 a year. So if you're making less than $60,000 a year, Find the $5,000 it takes to go to a local truck driving school. Find a local driving job. Don't go over the road. You won't make a lot of money. You'll be gone all the time. It's not a life I suggest unless it's the want to go see the country and get paid. But local driving pays way more. $5,000 investment takes four weeks to get that CDO. That's just one. There's there's welding. There's, um, you know, Chandler David Smith made a ton of money doing door-to-door -door sales for, um, what is it, insect control? Like there's a ton of ways to make more than the people say, well, I can only make $15 an hour. That's because you're not improving your income. Focus on that. That's how you save. And then you avoid life creep. Just because you're making more money doesn't mean you get more streaming services. It doesn't mean you get the better car, take the nicer vacation. You need to learn how to reduce your expenses. And for me, there's two main ways to do that. First is have a budget. And I don't have one. Never have, never will. I, I don't like people telling me what to do. And a budget is just me telling me what to do. Um, so have a budget to learn how to control your finances or house hack. If you can house hack, reduce or eliminate your largest expense or rent out rooms to somebody. When you buy that first investment property, can it be something like a small multifamily that you move into, own or occupy for better lending, less down, better interest rate, reducing or eliminating. And in my case, I'm actually being paid to live in the, I'm still house hacking a fourplex. I get paid to live here. Um, it's a lot easier to save money when you don't have a housing expense. Uh, so that's the first thing, save, right? So earn more, spend less. Second thing is work on your credit. You could be doing that right now before you even start investing. You haven't pick, picked a market local at a distance. You haven't picked an asset class. You haven't talked to a lender. You haven't talked to an agent. It's almost the last thing you do is talk to an agent. So you work on your credit score. And, and there, I would look at old Graham Stephan, you know, 2017, 2019 era, Graham Stephan on how to improve your credit. He's got some great videos. My credit score is only about an 800. So I am not a channel that teaches how to improve your credit score. If I had an 840, or higher, I'd probably teach you how to do that, but I can't. I'm at 800. My goal is to shoot for around an 800 because the best lending happens when the score that the lenders see is a 740 or higher. Your credit karma score, if it's 740, lenders are probably going to see 30 or 40 points below that. So I shoot for that 780 or higher to keep my score at 740 or higher on the lender side so that you get the best lending options. Um, all of that can, can be done now. You can be doing that over the first year that you're educating yourself, watching content like this, one rental at a time. Uh, the Lumberjack Landlord, uh, Millennial Mike, and there's a couple of other uh, Minority Mindset, just Josh Preet Singh. Um, I would say I watch Graham Stephan, but his older stuff, he really got into reaction videos. And every now and then, though, he does a really good core fundamentals of investing video. Uh, still recommend that. Meet Kevin, his older stuff too, his new stuff. Um, if you're into stocks, he probably has better information than, than, than definitely has better information than what I'm going to do because it's not my asset class. Um, but always be careful where you're getting your information. If somebody, and, and so Graham Stephan and me, Kevin, have great content, right? Especially if it's the stuff that you're looking to do. But if somebody makes the bulk of their income off of the course that they sell or the channel that they have, um, my YouTube channel this month is probably going to pay for a couple of meals, right? <laughs> it's not going to pay for my lifestyle, um, which my goal right now is to learn how to spend. I'm having trouble figuring out how to do that. It's about $17,000 a month coming in that I don't have to work for. 
and then there's YouTube and, and some affiliate programs out there. So there's even more money. Um, and I had just spent 10 years spending three or $4,000 a month. And it's really hard to break that habit because um, I took a trip to Vegas. And I came back with more money in the account than when I left. Um, who wants to teach me how to spend money? <laughs> Let me know. Um, yeah. So you learn how to save Jason, work on a credit score. Uh, so I worked in law enforcement, right? It was just eight years. So it wasn't like I had a 30 year a career and I'm a detective and can teach you how to do blah, blah, blah. But I have this perspective from law enforcement of a lot of people are going to say, pick an asset class, pick a strategy. Are you going to invest in single family or small multifamily? Are you going to invest local at her distance? So you kind of learn those strategies to get an idea of what they are, but then look at the market you're going to invest in. It is a lot easier to start investing where you live. But if you, and then around Chicago, maybe it's you're in the right area. If you're in Seattle or the middle of Los Angeles, you're going to start looking at a couple hours out, you know, Kern County or Fresno or, you know, something outside of the, the really high cost of living area. House hacking is more important in a high cost of living area. But investment properties, you might go to a distance. I'm in between Tacoma and Olympia and Washington. So I'm in the right area. I'm in that equilibrium of prices and rents to where I can find cash flowing properties on the MLS. I wanted to do single family houses. I owned one. I understood the, the, the idea. I was gonna I was gonna do the strategy where I buy a property, live in it for a year, buy a property, live in it for a year, and just rinse and repeat until I had about five or 10 properties and then I'd retire. Um, but single family houses in my area don't cash flow. So I couldn't be like a law enforcement officer shows up at a, at a crime scene and you can't go, I think this happened. Let me find the evidence that supports it. Right. So I couldn't go, I want to invest in single family. Let me look for the evidence that supports that that's gonna work. I had to look at the evidence and go, what does single family do? Oh, small multifamily has a better cash flow. It's easier to house hack, right? Um, so look at your market, figure out, you might be in an area where single family perform better than small multifamily. There are areas where that's true. Uh, so figure out which one you're going to do. What, so you, you kind of narrow down your strategy of what you want to do. Way before you talk to a realtor, you talk to a lender. You have them look at your personal credit score, income, uh, work history, uh, debt to income ratio, and they're going to tell you here are your options. Your options are you can borrow up to this amount, or you can't borrow anything. So now you have to look at DSCR lending, asset based lending, or seller financing, or one of the options. It doesn't include a lender, but you don't know that until you talk to a lender to find out what your options are. And it can be something simple like the lender going, I'm literally going to third par person speak this because this was the conversation. Dion, you make $17 an hour. You have you know, at the time I had $313,000 in bad debt because I hadn't negotiated it down to 89,000, which is possible. I should make that video. Um, let me know if you'd like to see that video. But I have $89,000 in bad debt that I had to take. So bad debt to income ratio, low income. I had gone from law enforcement to teaching truck driving. So I had a career change. Lender was like, you're not lendable. So the question, and they go, you're not lendable is why? First, we want to see consistent work in, in the same industry. So either go back into law enforcement or stay in uh, transportation for two years because I've worked in transportation before. Or two, you make a lot more money, you triple your income, at least to, to be able to buy you know a house in this area. $17 an hour is not going to do it. Um, or get rental income on your tax returns. If once you own a rental for two years and you have rental income on your tax returns, lenders will look at 75% of incoming rents, even on the property you're looking at buying in your debt to income ratio. So I moved from my house into an apartment and rented out the house for two years. I had two years consistent income uh, in transportation. I had rental income on my tax returns. Uh, and it, it's, it seems weird because you're going to show a loss with depreciation of write-offs. You're going to be like, I don't pay any taxes. Why will they lend to me? Well, they take depreciation out. So it actually looks like you make a ton, ton of money in real estate. Um, I was able to then pick the strategy and house hack because I looked at the market and figured out what worked by talking to a lender and finding out what my options are. Your options might be totally different, but you won't know until you talk to a lender. Once you have picked a market, picked a strategy, learned the basics, now you go and find an agent. I recommend three set up auto searches, um, get, you know, find, get, get, get your eyes on as many properties in your area. And, and one agent isn't going to be able to show you, even if you're an agent and you have access to the MLS, I would have other agents with auto searches set up because in over 12 years, only one time have my agent sent me the same deal within 12, 24 hours, right? Uh, eventually once it's on the MLS for three or four weeks, I'll start to see every deal from each agent, but which one came in in the first day, it's always different agents. I still get them different from different agents. I have one who's amazing and almost Almost all my deals have gone through him, um, but if somebody else sent me the, the listing first, that's who I'd go with. That agent is smart. When he sees something that sounds like it's mine in my auto search, he texted me two days ago and said, hey, did you see this one? 
did this one cross your radar? It kind of hits all your buttons. And I was like, oh, okay, let me take a look at it. Um, so that's how I would start. Self-education and do those steps. And being here and alive, that's a big part of the self-education. Because right now you're going to have these random questions, you know, like, oh, it's a stupid question. I could probably just Google it. There's 10 other people in here wondering the same thing. And 100 people in future land that are going to watch this video later who are wondering the same thing. At this moment, what would an investor know? What would they keep in touch? That's the point of the live streams. In order to reach financial freedom, I have to make decisions quick. I see a listing within five to 10 seconds. I know, am I going to completely dismiss it? Or am I going to take a deeper look and make an offer within 30 minutes? Right, like That's the amount of time I have because of not having to do researches. Words are hard. That was great grammar. Disappointment in my grammar. I don't have to research things like how much of my gold will a lender look as a reserve? I know that they won't look at cash in a safe as a reserve because it doesn't have a known source. So does gold, do you have a proof point of, you know, proof, proof of point of purchase of when and how long you've owned it and that kind of stuff? Um, and there you go. <laughs> but Mike, everybody trash talks Gary. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> um, I was on Bigger Pockets episode 448. So if you watch the Bigger Pockets show, that was my episode. I mentioned having a rental near Tacoma. And the first thing Brandon Turner does is downplays Tacoma because it had they used to have a paper mill. And so the, the there's a smell in a certain part of town. I don't know anywhere near that. My response is I don't care what it smells like. There's a couple of rentals there that made work optional. Um, although smell does matter. There was a town, Lacey, Washington, where there was a mushroom farm, Ostrom's mushroom. They lost court case. Uh, they were there first, so they should have won. But the city grew up around it. They didn't like the smell. So they lost court case and had to move. Well, working in transportation and knowing that the truck drivers were moving and they were relocating all their stuff, kind of had legal insider trading knowledge. So I purchased a duplex three streets away. So not, not three blocks, but three literal streets away from where the mushroom farm is, where rents were 1,100, 1,200. Mushroom farm's gone, 2,000, 2,200. Same unit. Legal insider training. Trading. All that I had a great point. Started building my insurance before I started building my wealth. Got I'm glad I got this insurance, but could have progressed sooner. Good point. Samik, how about 10 to 30 percent of the rent invested is dividend stocks or index funds with a horizon of five to ten years? So uh, there's two ways to grow a portfolio. There's probably thousands, but there's two main ways that I know of to grow a real estate portfolio. If you want high number count, you know, hundreds of units, I, th I think recycling capital is much more effective. So Matt, the lumberjack landlord, Michael Zuber, they have uh, sold for 1031s. They've cashed out refinance. They've taken out home equity on the credits. They've recycled capital. So as the appreciation and principal pay down happen, they've taken the equity and put it to work. Great strategy. It's not what I did. Super lazy, like stability, had a 10-year horizon for financial freedom. I have 16 units, and I don't know that I want that many. Like, I might want less, right? So I'm not looking to grow. So the other version is to recycle cash flow. So every time I got a rental, that new cash flow didn't make my life better. It made my savings faster for the next investment. Until I hit the income snowball, about eight years. Then I started getting nice cars, taking trips, month-long vacations. Everything changed about the eight-year mark. Um, First five years suck, but they get better. Uh, if I had taken the cash flow from the real, real estate and put them into stocks, I would not have grown my portfolio as fast. If I had taken the cash flow, I would have had the bandwidth to recycle capital because they also had cash flow that they were using to recycle the capital. Uh, so to grow your portfolio, no. Once you have it, sure, I might take some of my rental income and start buying dividend stocks, diversify. Again, Charlie Munger, don't diversify to become wealthy, but once you're wealthy, you can diversify. Uh, so there'd be a, chron a chronology to the timeline there. How, whether it's five years or 10 years, once you hit the income snowball and the money's coming in faster than you know what to do with, which is an actual real thing that happens. Uh, yeah, then maybe. A lot of people were, were putting a lot into AT&T because they had a 7% dividend for years. And all of a sudden they were like, hey, we're going to drop that to 3%. And the problem with dividend stocks, do not take stock investing from me. Not just a random guy on YouTube like Josh Breed says. I mean, literally me. I don't invest in stocks. But here's something I do know about stocks. This is not advice. This is just something I know. 
when a dividend stock pays out a dividend, the stock value goes down by the amount of the dividend payout. So does it sound like you're actually gaining anything? Fillion. Yep, check that HAP. I'll have to wonder what that is. Housing. No. All letter hunter. YouTube is more forgetful than a whole nation of potheads. Glad you made it, Matthew. So it depends on what your 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 definition of that is. Um, this is a real estate channel. This is not a, a thing, but I have never met a police officer who didn't think that marijuana should be legal. They, they all think it should be legal. I've never been beat up by the stoned guy. Uh, it's always the drunk. And it's so weird that we can make alcohol legal and think it's totally normal. Or water. Oculus, howdy. Thank you for the question. Knowing what you know now, what would you look for in counties where you would rent to Section 8? What are the red flags? So knowing what I know now, I know why I invest in one and not the other. Um, that water made my eyes water. Um, you can't drink all day unless you start early. The red flags are communication style. And um, I want a housing authority that's thirsty, right? I want them, I want them hungry for, for um, units. And, and most places are, but the, the, the agency is a state worker. Right. They're just working. It can be a nonprofit in your area, too. But are they just complacent working in there, checking a box saying, I did this paperwork. This paperwork is not right. We're not going to continue versus I have a county, Thurston County, Washington. I don't want to call it the bad one, but Pierce County sucks. So Thurston County, uh, the inspector shows up. Now, don't expect this. This this might have been a one off, but the inspector shows up for an inspection and we're literally checking all this stuff and I'm having a refrigerator swapped out. So it's a new refrigerator. I put in saloon style doors into a walk-in closet because it has to be have doors to be a closet. Like I did all these kind of things and she could tell I did all new LVP flooring. I'm taking care of the place. I'm not just like, it's terrible. So a regular person's not going to rent. So I'm going to section eight. I know it's a nice place, but it's on a lake, lake access. I want section eight. I want, there's a lady there with four kids that those kids get to go to a good school district, live on a lake, have that experience on the voucher program. She has an 830 had it's probably better now, but she had an 831 credit score when she moved in. So these are good tenants. Uh behind the refrigerator, the faceplate to the electric thing, um blue box, whatever, uh, was cracked and missing a portion. And you you can't have any exposed electrical or anything totally on a rental. You just shouldn't. I don't know how that got there, why it was that way. I remember this was a house I'd lived in before it was a rental, so it was probably that way when I bought it, because I had that was my refrigerator that had been there. 11 years, right? It was 11 year old fridge and switching it out. The inspector went to her truck and got a faceplate and came and said, if we put that on there, you're good to go. And there was like three other things that exterior light that wasn't working right. Um, and of a uh, strip, weather stripping on a door at the bottom. Um, my animals had effed up the weather stripping at the bottom and you could see a little bit of daylight on there. So, so there's a couple of repairs I didn't actually think to do. Um, and then the, the the person is how I learned this strategy. She said, look, we can schedule another appointment. It'd probably be like two to three weeks. It's probably gonna take you a day to fix this. Why don't you email me a video tomorrow of these being fixed and I'll sign it off from my office without having to do a follow up. So Thurston County, Washington, amazing. Because response time, they worked with you. They weren't adversarial. Pierce County, um, I don't know why I don't cuss on YouTube <laughs> because I cuss in real life, but Pierce County Housing Authority can F off all the way over to F offville with their effing way of doing things. Uh, so go and interact with them. Ask, what does it take to get on your system? And if they're helpful, if they just go, well, you got to go to the website and apply. Yeah, that's your first red flag. If it takes a while for them to respond to an email, don't ever communicate with a state agency um, in person, over the phone, or the voicemail, or anything that can be ignored, and a boss doesn't know about it. Always communicate with an electronic email, you know, an email, so that their boss sees the date and timestamp of when the communication was sent. If you communicate with an agency and it takes them a long time to reply to an email, more than four business days, that's another red flag. That's what I would look for. Um, the the HUD report basically comes out the website 
let's see if I can get it into the chat here real quick. This is where they will tell you how much they pay based on county. So you can actually go to this website and look this up. Just see, based on my county, this is how much they're going to pay in my area. That's their limit. And they have a 10% variance. They can actually go above that if there's not enough units. So if in your area for a two-bedroom, they'll pay 1500 And they say, we only pay 1100 because we've got a bunch of units and that's what they take. Third red flag, right? They should pay at least what they the, the maximum allowable is. Um, and if you know that they're short, you should be pushing for that 10% high. If area average rents are above that, if area average rents are below that, you know, have the so I use the minor strategy on the housing authority. Uh, they told me 1800 was the most that they could pay. I said, I need 2200 because here's the comps at 23, 24. I'm not even going to area average, I'm just going a little bit above that. And they went to 22. After sending me an email saying that was their maximum, they will make that adjustment. So if they won't, if they won't budge, don't lose money to rent to section eight. Um, Matthew, if you don't want all 16, you could give one of you to your members. Come on, 20 sided that dice. Yeah, sure. That's exactly how that works. Um, yeah. Sometimes I make bad trades. <laughs> so, does this, uh, this, and that's way too much of an overshare and way too early in the morning for the water to be making me want to talk about that. But I three kids, um, I one custody three times. So one custody, then went to war and started to give custody, came back from the war, one custody again, then one custody in the second divorce. Um, my ex-wife, so I got the house and the kids, and my ex-wife got my 1970 Ford Mustang that I had redone everything in. So my poor kids grew up always hearing, yep, I would have traded any one of you for that car. Uh, Millennial Mike, why I am not on here. Where was the invite, Dion? I'm home like loser. Well, just chilling. Oh. Didn't I ask you yesterday if you were off today? I thought I did. Should have put that in your super chat, Mike. Oh, so, uh, Millennial Mike reminded me of this. I have to make a separate video because this is so far into the live that I'm probably not going to remember to actually do this. Um, There is a live event at the Robin Hood Resort um, on the 21st. So it's the weekend of the 21st. There is a live event at the Robin Hood Resort for uh, Cody and Christian multifamily strategies um, where you can have a day pass. So you can be there on the 21st. Um, I think it's $150. Or you could rent the weekend. And, and I'm going to I'm going to pin a comment with who you contact. Um, at the after this video but you can also reach out to cody and christian on their channel here it's cody and christian multifamily strategies right here on youtube um millennial mike and i are going to be presenting on the 21st um there will have um, they have other presenters there cody and christian are presenting obviously um they probably have that other um, um couple of young guys that i'm going to be having on the channel here pretty soon um but they're not fully booked up yet um and i only know that because they reached out and said hey do you know anybody who wants to come because it books up quick. Last time it booked up so fast. Um, I think it was like a couple of weeks where people wanted to go and couldn't because they only have so many rooms, right? Not sure how many they can fit in their day pass. Um, but that's on the 21st. So I'm going to make a, a separate video talking about that too. All night or hydro debate or clarification of arg arguments. Fine line between the two sometimes. Exactly. <laughs> Eat my shorts. Little Bart Simpson reference for people that it's still going on. It's like in season, what, 435, right? And we have a random guest to our random midday live stream because he left a comment, said he was off today. Good job. <laughs> At least you went to get a shirt. You can say pants hey. are optional. Hey, if you're going to pick a fight with me, okay, if you're going to pick a fight with me, Talk trash about my rentals. I know you come strapped, bro. I'm coming prepared. Yeah, that uh, will stop bullets. It doesn't stop knives. That's true. That's true. <clears throat> so I did two things in that video. First, I wanted to reference your channel. That's always my goal. 
Second, I did say, if you're going to do it at a distance, that's how you do it. Mm -hmm. You either develop the team there or you piggyback on somebody who developed the team there. Look, my fragile YouTube influencer ego heard one negative thing about me, about myself, and I immediately jumped to the absolute worst possible conclusion. So if you want to talk trash about Gary, you and Rob down in the comments, you want to talk trash about low cash flowing rental properties, uh, you know, we're, we're going to just have to have a fight about it. We have to have a debate about it. Yeah, so we'll, we'll definitely do that in a standalone video too. That So low cash flowing, but high yield. Right, that's the thing to point out. You're you're, you're getting twenty percent yield on most of your investments, or better, right? Yeah, eighteen to twenty-two percent cash on cash return. So I absolutely think it's a solid strategy. The the the, the debate, the the Dion side of lazy things. One duplex in McKenna, Washington, where the population is six hundred and something, mm -hmm. cash flows a little over thousand dollars a unit. It's pretty good. So two thousand dollar cash flow. Uh, one rental. Mm. I, I have interacted with those tenants in the last year, three times. Mm -hmm. Both asked if they could add a pet. So I allow pets that added income to me. And the other one is is, is a nice lady who, who doesn't do the interwebs and has a flip phone. So she gives me all of her checks for the rent for the year at one time. So I had to literally go and I just pick up the check, say hi. Or how many rentals in Gary, Indiana does it take to have $2,000 in cash flow? And you, you have property management, so you probably have the same level of interaction that I do. Yeah, so it would take four. But my question for you, Dion, how much did that duplex cost you? So hang on, it would take four to get 2000 Oh, to get 2000 Sorry, I thought the number was 1000 So it would be eight. 1000 per unit, right. So, so one purchase, $2,000 in income per month. Profit. Yeah, and profit. Yeah, we're just talking about the profit, the cash flow. So it would take eight. So it would take eight. Okay, so out of pocket to acquire that property, I did a 25% down. Uh, it was like $397,000. It was 400, but I negotiated down a little, right? So closing costs, immediate repairs was like 150 bucks. So I was out about $106,000 out of pocket to acquire eight properties in Gary, Indiana. Out of pocket. How much would you be? Let's see, you're probably close to 100000 Okay, so we're really close in cost. Yeah. Um, transactions, you're uh, eight to one, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's comparable. I, I don't have uh, Matsky to go to and say, hey, let me piggyback and do Gary, right? So I wouldn't do that. Right. Right. So we definitely have a debate to do there where both strategies are reaching financial freedom. Mm. Like, mm. I, and I think yours is going to be better. You're going to have more properties that can appreciate, that can have principal pay down, that you can recycle capital on. So your eight will become 80. And I have absolutely no doubt that's going to happen. My 16 is probably going to come 10. Mm -hmm. And my cash flow is going to be 300,000 a year instead of 200,000 a year. I, I need 40, right? So lazy. Also, I'm old enough to be your grandfather, right? So there's kind of an age very Don't look to be my dad. Real. You and my son Matt, you guys are the same age. So we are the yeah, exactly. <laughs> so my response to that, Dion, would be okay. So we're two things. Number one, there's a lot of people out there who saving up a hundred thousand dollars seems to be an insurmountable task, almost impossible, very difficult to do. And in the time it takes them to save up a hundred grand, if they're not going to house hack, right? In the time it takes for them to save up a hundred grand for that 20% down payment, prices historically over the last 12 years, at least, have gone up and up and up and up and up. But it's a much more uh, realistic goal to save up $15,000 to get a rental. And then that rental helps you save up to get your next, which helps you to save up to get your next. And that's, so that's point number one. And, and, and Glover in the comments down here was talking about, it's impossible to house hack in a $2 million duplex market, which I think we could do a video on how maybe he could still make it work. And it might just come down to saying, dude, I couldn't house hack in Seattle. I had to move. You Brandon might not Turner's be doing it in Hawaii. Right. Well, and I, and I don't know the market out there. Marco Shiro could speak to it better than me, but yeah, dude, you might just have to move way away from the city, get the house hack and then slowly move, move back because you make more money, but that's a different topic. Point number two I want to make, you've got one rental. You use the binder strategy, you get them up to market value rents. After you binder strategy, people, 
How frequently do you raise their rent? Do you binder strategy strategy them every year, every couple of years? 5% every other year. Unless okay. we have a 2021 one-off, then it was binder strategy entire portfolio and just about double the rents, like the, not the rents, the profit. Mm -hmm. Like I went from 128,000, 2021, 203,000, 2022, didn't buy anything in 2022, right? So yes, the binder strategy then was a massive increase. So obviously I can bind your strategy to get people up to near market level rents. But when I have, and this is a Grant Cardone tactic, when I have 10 units, 10 doors, and I just take each one $25 more, that's 250 bucks extra a month across the whole portfolio. If I take a 50, that's 500 per month. Um, so there is some scalability there. If you get a bunch of smaller properties or cheaper properties, you can kind of scale that rent using very small rent increases. So you're not pissing people off. Um, and then the, the last point that I would make, uh, my properties, I want them to cash flow $250 day one. That is, my, that is my threshold for a great deal. But I have properties that cash flow $500 or $600 or $700 a month as well. And I mean, I can think of a duplex that I bought last year, $90,000 duplex. My payment on that duplex is $550 a month. It rents for $1,600 a month. Now, obviously, I have a few more expenses there, but I mean, I'm cash flowing 700 bucks uh, for the whole unit, right? So that maybe be like 350 aside. And so, yes, 250 to equate to a thousand is a lot of units. But if I can get five or six hundred, then it's maybe I only need two to your one. And it doesn't seem like currently either one of us invest for appreciation. Heck no, it's the dumbest right. thing ever. If you invest in Gary, Indiana for appreciation, you are a fool. So, so anyone who would would say my argument would be more strong if I said, well, you know, we've had 24% appreciation here in Tacoma, so I'm making more money. I would disagree with that because I don't touch appreciation. Right, right. I mean, That's it not definitely my benefited strategy. you. Right. It, it benefited you, and I'm happy that you've got it. I was, I mean, my properties have appreciated as well, but a, a $50,000 house going to 55000 is 10% appreciation, but it's not really what I'm looking for. That's not going to change my life with that number. If you're going through the comments, okay. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna continue to make we'll sure. Keep, keep going. I'm looking for the Laura was gonna have a question in here. Sure. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. hey, down in the comment section below, if you live in an extremely expensive market, Matt the lumberjack landlord wants me to do a course. He has encouraged me to create my own course, and I'm gonna take his advice on it because when somebody and I'm sworn to secrecy on his financial numbers, but when somebody could buy you a hundred times over, tells you to do something, or tells you to fly to Vegas to meet up with him and his family, when he says jump, I say, yes, sir, how high? That's what I do. So when he says, make a course, I have a plan for it, I need it. I say, all right, sounds good. He's like, out of state investing, because a lot of people live in sucky markets and they wanna do it. All right, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it. There is a lot of people like Glover, like myself, even like you, Without house hacking, without house hacking, Dion, I think it would have been way harder for you to get started if you had not house hacked. I don't know that I would have been able to get started without, without yeah. that. I, I tell everybody, it's the one reason why I think I reached financial freedom. And everybody's like, well, I can't house hack. Okay, great. Are you making six or multiple six figures and living on $30,000 a year? Then you can invest without house hacking. Sure. And I'm sure other people can do it too, but then, then it, at a distance uh, becomes a lot more attractive. Hmm. So here's the question from Laura who did a super chat. And then the question came and went a couple of times because she likes to make me lose sleep. Laura says, I want to retire in three years. Question, any thoughts on how I can use my pension money to buy a property? A lump sum will put me in a higher tax bracket. Uh, they, you know, they, all financial players offer stocks and annuities. The reason they do that is because they get paid an ongoing management fee if you're in annuities. So they're always going to say that that's your best bet. Those predators on base that were trying to find veterans and say, hey, let me manage your money. Every time they would come up to me because I'm a veteran and they would go, let me manage your money. I would say I own rentals. They would just walk away because there's no money for them, no way for them to make money managing my rentals unless they do a flat fee, which is not worth their time. They'd rather get 1% of your money, whether you make money or lose money. So your pension to acquire a property is, is going to add to your stability for lending. It, uh, yeah, the lump sum. And so you you have one rental that I know of. If you've got the lump sum and you took out the cat the taxes, would the money that you put to work get a good enough return to justify the loss of doing the lump sum and paying the taxes? 
So not do you think you could find that deal, but is that deal actually there? Do you have confidence that if you made the offer at the numbers that make sense to you, they would accept it at that number? So I don't know that that's a thing. If you're house hacking once and you have three years, you don't have all the bad debt that I did. I think if you house hacked again, so in three years, that's two more times, adding at least four units to your portfolio. Uh, you're in Florida, you have high uh, market demand. Um, so I'd have to know, you're, so we should we should have a call or email me, we'll set up a call. You've, you've been commenting, you've done all this kind of stuff. You don't have to win the dice roll. Let's go through and see if we can figure that out. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of different strategies that you could technically use to get at that money. Um, but yeah, are you going to have to pay some taxes on it? Yeah, the, the some people do self-directed IRAs. They convert everything to cash. They buy rentals within their IRA. But the only problem is, is then you still can't take any, any of the money. You can't get access to that cash flow out of the IRA until you hit the retirement stage. So if you did want to convert to real estate, um, you can, you just still won't get at that money. But, you know, I know people who've done it that way. It's been good for them, but obviously the majority of their portfolio has to be outside of that. Otherwise they can't touch that cash flow. But, but there was one, and I'll highlight a quick strategy somebody did. Let's say, let's say, Laura, you wanted to buy a package deal of five houses from one seller. Now these five houses, he wants 20% down on all five houses. But instead of doing 20% down on all five houses, you take your retirement account and pay 100% of one of those houses. You buy it 100%. So he still got the same cash amount as if he had gotten 20% on each of them. But instead you paid 100% for one of those houses, put it in the retirement account. And then he gives you the other four outside of the retirement account. So the retirement account owns that one house cash outright. You can't touch the cash flow till you retire. But the other four houses are not contained within the Roth IRA and you can use them however you want. That's exactly the strategy my mentor Mark did with his self-directed IRA. He bought nine houses and put the down payment for all nine at 20%. Instead, he just bought one of them straight cash. The other eight are outside of it and he gets the cash flow and access to those eight. So there are things that you could do, but it is much more complex. And it really depends on this pension. Is it is it pension based from employment or is it your retirement account that you can convert to a Roth or that kind of stuff? So like I said, that's going to take a call where we really going to get into it. Not a financial planner. I'm just going to talk through as a human what I would do in that situation. And then All Night Hyder says that you can absolutely house hack a duplex in a $2 million area as long as you just turn the other side into a strip club. <laughs> I would think dispensary might work as well. Uh, an only fan studio <laughs> only homes yes all night hider says as long as the channel pays for another skull full of water we're good exactly and then glover um four hundred thousand plus down payment mortgage payment thirteen thousand max rents thirty five hundred so you're still responsible for ten thousand monthly mortgage payments i don't get it i really don't yeah um Th that that's the way high cost of living areas are. There's like a, a center where the numbers just don't make sense. Rents don't come anywhere close. Grant Cardone would say, yeah, it totally makes sense. You buy there because you know, you're know you going to have 20% appreciation over the next couple of years. You're going to sell it. You're going to walk away with $500,000 that you didn't have before. So who cares what you lose every month? And if you have a portfolio worth hundreds of millions of dollars and you're going to take that risk on one $2 million place, sure, right? But not the person where the cash flow would kill you. Um, and that the chance for appreciation might just vanish. Uh, so from that city, you draw a circle and you keep going out further and further. And that might be from New York. It might be Indiana. It might be from <laughs> Sacramento. It's Fresno. It might be from Seattle. It's Tacoma, right? And you, how far out is that circle to where the rents and the prices hit an equilibrium where it is possible to make money? Yeah, you got to make a sacrifice. It's exactly what I did. I work in Seattle. I'm there every single day, but I live 44 miles away. I'm I'm allowed to in my uh, in my bargaining agreement live up to 45 miles away. So me and every other officer who works in the Seattle area, we all live 44, 45 miles away, north, east, or south, because houses are way more affordable out here, and then we can commute into work and still stay within our bargaining agreement. So yeah, it sucks. It's but that's the sacrifice you have to make. And now I could afford to buy that $2 million duplex because I've made that sacrifice, saved enough money, had enough equity. I could, but I but I don't want to. I still would rather not spend that money and just live further away. 
Right, and in an area with less of the crazy laws. Right. Dividend Dave says, can we repeat the last hour? He's a little late. Howdy, Dave. Sure, we actually talked a little bit about uh, different asset classes for investing, which is why ape love ape, which is hard to say without the going into the, you know, the, the ape voice. Thinking we see 18 to 19,000 on Bitcoin, which I think last time I looked was 17,000, so it's possible again, but I'm holding. My mom's buying crypto now. Hype is too hyped already. I don't, you know, I think a dump is coming. Um, absolutely, all of that's entirely possible. The thing I really like about crypto ape is, is, is um, do you trust the asset? If you trusted the asset, like if you had a crystal ball and you could go forward 10 years and you could actually see, like with factual knowledge, in 10 years, uh, Bitcoin was a million dollars a coin. What would what would you do today? Right? You'd 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 sell your car, you'd you'd go into debt, you'd take out mortgages, you'd get all the money you can, buy as many Bitcoin as you could. So in 10 years, you'd have benefit from that if you factually knew it. That's why we invest in real estate. Now it isn't going to hit a million dollars a coin kind of metric numbers, but when have we ever seen over a 10 year period property prices not be higher than they were 10 years ago? In 2008, they crashed to 2000 levels, still higher than 99 and 98. A 10 year period, the biggest crash we've ever seen didn't lower it market wide. There are some areas where yes, Sacramento dropped 75% because it's Silicon Valley, whatever like that area can be hit but so have several economic drivers that's why we go fixed rate debt we plan long term and when we know that in 10 years that's why this debt's going to pay off you you buy a house today you're underwater because it costs eight percent to sell so if you sold it tomorrow you're gonna lose eight percent of the purchase price every time a home is purchased at market price you're underwater so you wait long enough for the appreciation and pay down to happen to where you can sell and make money um, some of us have the goal of never selling ml howdy I have a rental with AC filters on the ceiling. Is it a good idea to leave the house with a ladder and filters for the tenant to replace? Nope. Nope. If it requires anything leaving the ground, I have a handyman or somebody with insurance do it. I don't want a tenant doing that. I would do it myself. If a tenant does it themselves and they provided the equipment, um, I'm not telling my tenants not to, but I set it up on a routine schedule. The, the ones where it's easy access, I, I do go in once a year or have a handyman go in once a year to do the filter and leave three filters for the, the off tour times so that we walk through and see, does it smell like smoke? Are there extra pets? Are there three families living here? Like the random things we would care about. So Laura says, I use the binder method to force my property management to increase the rent on a renewal and new tenant. Also, I am house hacking because of you. So sad you can't see my question. Sorry, you, <laughs> it's because you took it back a couple times. Um, yeah, the binder strategy will work with your property manager. If you look at area average rents and you see that your property manager is renting up, if, if you live in Olympia, Washington, and you're using hometown, whatever that place is, and they put up a four bedroom house where everyone else is getting 3000 a month and you're renting it for 1500 you should probably call your property manager and show them some area average comps. Because um, the investors around here just know that when they list a rental, you don't list for three days. You wait for somebody to find that, that owner to lose a bunch of money, and then you list at regular price, and it still goes. <laughs> Alec, howdy. Any info from Dion is better than gold. Thank you. It is pretty valuable. And even though Dion and I have to have a disagreement in a fight, uh, you know, I obviously I'm not going to pick a fight with the CEO of Howdy. He's going to hit me. Howdy. And that would be the last thing I ever heard. I'd just be done. So, so it, most of the time we team up. So, so the, the great thing is Zuber, property management, you know, a couple hours away, recycles capital, switched from small multifamily to multifamily to small multifamily, lumberjack landlord, growing a property management company, doing $600,000 worth of rehab, recycling capital, you investing at a distance. Me house hacking, doing it the lazy way. There, there literally is no right way to do this. Like there's a right way for each person watching and they're going to take from Matt. Oh, that, that's what you do with electric replacements. It's only like 60 bucks to replace everything, all the covers. And, and you're going to get that much more rent, like little things like that. And you go to Zuber and you're like, wow, one rental at a time actually does this. And then based on your market, based on your goals, 
your strategy or my strategy, all of these have elements that people can use. Um, I think it works great together. And and Matt and Mike and 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 you know Zuber, Mike and me really disagreed in 2021. Um, I had a paid off house, which there's a question coming up here. I think I saw I want to get to where somebody asked if I would pay off the house. I would not ever pay off the house again. I paid it off because I wasn't educated, didn't think I can have more than four mortgages, and I had four mortgages and, and it was highest interest rate, lowest debt. So I paid it off. I wouldn't do it again because the money would have made more money investing in something else than paying off that home. Um they were telling me I should refinance that property, take out a 50% loan to value, make the dry kindling. So I had it if the, you know, if the crash happens or the right deal pops up uh, because they are in growth mode always. Doesn't matter how many units they have right now. It seems like they're just going to acquire, acquire, get the next thing. Mine was I've reached financial freedom. I'm really close to retiring. I don't want more units. Um, and my portfolio is really small compared to theirs. I have seven properties. So having one paid off is, is a really small percentage. Whereas if they have 130, they probably each have several paid off that they don't even really know or care about. Mm -hmm. It's just part of their portfolio. Right. We can all disagree. Jason, howdy. I'm 45. My credit is great. I make very good money. I have been putting it all in stocks. Don't want to anymore. I need to find the correct market. Thank you very much for sharing your knowledge. Thank you. Awesome. So looks like you're starting from a good position and the self-education. Mike, Jason had a question at the very beginning. So really good. Brock, howdy. I appreciate you being here for the content. Andres, howdy. What do you think about tapping into the 401k for real estate investing or should one leave it for retirement considering they have been coming down? So I'll let you go first, and then I have a thought on that too. Yeah, um, I mean, <laughs> tapping into your four hundred one k, kind of what we just talked about. If there's going to be stiff penalties, you're going to have to, you know, to cash that out early, take the cash and put it in something else. You have to kind of consider the cost of liquidating that into your overall return. Um, but ultimately, you know, four hundred one ks are traditionally invested into stocks or index funds or mutual funds, and I know by personal experience that real estate does better. Um, now, with your 401k, if your employer will give you a match, like if it's access to money that you wouldn't get otherwise, well, then, yeah, I mean, why not take the match? Why not take a little bit of extra money? Because it's a guaranteed 100% return if they're going to give you that match. But I wouldn't invest any more than that. Um, I do have a Roth IRA. For those who don't know, I actually have a Roth IRA. In order to max out a Roth IRA, it's a little over $6,000 a year. I have made the decision, even though I know that the Roth IRA is not going to perform as good as my real estate. It's a small enough expense each year that it's worth it to me for the diversity aspect of it to invest that tiny little bit into the Roth IRA, 500 bucks a month. I put in a Roth IRA, I put in the mutual funds just in case I, I don't know, something crazy happens with real estate. Well, I'll take a little bit of diversity, but I mean, it's a very, very small amount of money to me now to invest that each month. But Everything. I mean, I try to focus almost almost exclusively on real estate. It's just so much better for so many different reasons. So you make some really really good points, especially the don't over con contribute. You know, do the match, but more than that, there were years where I put in the maximum for tax benefits. That's that's how educated I or uneducated I was on what came to that. Um, planning on retiring at fifty nine, thinking taxes would be lower, hoping to retire broke so that I would be in a lower tax bracket. Like all the wrong things to think, not realizing that they're making money, like you said right now. Andre said, you know, the stock market is, is going down. Most retirement accounts are down. The people managing their accounts are still making money. Like they mm -hmm. don't care if it goes up or down. Um, they want it to go up because more people are more likely to con continue to contribute. But if you're looking at real estate because they're coming down, I don't think that's the right reason. Uh, I hate the idea of retirement accounts. I don't want money trapped in a retirement account. But for most people who don't invest in real estate, it's, it's better than nothing, right? So, so that's a good thing to have. If you're going to invest in real estate, Stop contributing more than the match so that you can save money for your investing in real estate. Don't empty out a retirement account just because you hear that people like me did that in 2020 when they, they waived the 10% penalty because of the CARES Act. We emptied it out and bought a rental. I had several rentals then. I had strategies in place. I knew the binder strategy. I had cash flow to handle it. I didn't need the retirement account. I wasn't counting on it. It wasn't even a part of my metric for when I do get to the age where I could tap it. Um, and I had confidence in my ability to get the return I would expect. If you touch your 401k on your first deal, you're probably going to lose money. You might miss time things, not know how long rehabs take, not understand the cost to acquire, not understand the cost of selling if you do, um, not be able to time your burr or your flip or whatever you're going to use your money for. There's like all these strategies you don't know yet. 
And even if you study for thousands of hours, I don't think we know it until we have a rental and we know what it's like to actually talk to a tenant, see their unreasonable expectations and how an easy conversation can fix most things. Um, what's it like to find a lease, place a tenant, screen a tenant, retain an attorney, have your systems in place, like all those things that make the, the rentals, an average rental turn into a great deal, happens because you, you have the experience. So you get the knowledge from studying, but you get the experience from doing. Once you have that, I'm actually a fan of emptying out a retirement account and buying a rental. I don't think you borrow against your retirement account. I don't think you buy a rental in a retirement account, um, but not until you have three or four. And does it meet your goal, right? Are you 55 going to retire in a few years? Maybe not touch it. Are you 30 and have $100,000 in a retirement account that's got behind a paywall until you're 59 and a half and you have learned how to invest and you know you're going to get a return? I would definitely take the money out and put it to work. I would continue to contribute for the match. The only difference when it comes to contributing for the match is if you're looking for employment and you're looking at two employers, one has a 401k and one does not. Look at their compensation package. I've, I've ran a company. When we developed a retirement account, you basically say, this is what we're willing to pay our people. If we lower what we pay, we can put it back into a retirement account for retention. So it benefits the employer. You might make more money not having a match at a 401k at a different company that you then have control to invest. So you still get the free money. It just comes in your wage instead of the 401k. The tax benefits of real estate are a billion times better than the tax benefits of every retirement account. So that's my thoughts on that. Glover says that it really grinds his gears when you hear house hack in an expensive area. So a duplex, yeah, it's probably like in a cash flow. Have you looked at a triplex or a fourplex? Right. Now, the response Brandon's, would be that they're even more expensive. If a duplex is two million, that triplex is three. Not always. Brandon Turner's in Hawaii, where the triplex and the duplex is not that big a difference in price, um, because one of them is an ADU, so he's living for free in Hawaii. Yes, it took a billion dollars to get the down payment, right? So you, you're restricting. Uh, your market might not be the place for it. It's entirely possible. And when we say it, it's higher cost of living area, not highest cost of living area. Um, I don't know why anyone lives in Seattle or New York or middle of Los Angeles. Um, it's a it's a law enforcement thing. Out of every 100 people, there are three sociopaths and one <laughs> uh, person willing to kill you for nothing. The bigger the city, that's a lot of 100 groups of people, yeah. uh, let alone the cost. So, and then I lost my chat. So Adam, and I'm, it's not where I'm at in the chat, so I'm going to look at it. Howdy, Adam. If we don't ever see the 40 to 50% increase in rent that we saw in the last three years, do you think freedom in 10 years or less is still easily achievable? I achieved it before that. Yeah, I've been saying that since before that. <laughs> yeah, it happened way before that. Um, and, and without that increase, I would have made 168000 this in, in 2022, right? So there was a rent increase that that made it higher to two hundred and three, um, But the 168 in 10 years, starting with a lot of bad debt, not making a lot of money. Uh, absolutely. I don't, I don't think that those rent increases are required, but it's like appreciation. Don't invest for that. Like that's a needed part of your plan, but you benefit from it when it happens. Right. Thank you, All Nighter Hyder. Cody and Christian's assistant is named Hannah. Her number is, <laughs> given that on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> this is for the event. Uh, on the 21st at the Robin Hood Resort in Union, Washington. This is about an hour, an hour west of Tacoma. Uh, it's a multi-day event, so you can book a room at the Robin Hood event, or you can do an all-day pass on the 21st, where Mike and I will both be there. Presenting together, because Dion is a true gentleman, and he always looks out for me, and he invites me to these things, even when I don't get invited. He's like, hey, you should bring this guy. So Dion is a real one. He's a good battle buddy. It's the best way to describe it. Well, once they have you there and they see you present and then like the next comment from, from uh, Shred, Mike bringing the funny today, uh, you have an amazing sense of humor. You're quick. You, ha you have the great content with a sense of humor. So that's something I don't have. Um, once they have that, then, then people will just start bringing you to these things. Um, and I will be expecting reciprocity. <laughs> So I'm invite, yeah, dude, I, I can't, I'm sorry. I get stage fright. I have to have Dion there. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. He's, he's my emotional support, Dion. <laughs> <laughs> I am fun size, so it works. Anna Kay, 
One high cost real estate cost of down payment is a risk. Having multiple cheaper real estates, I consider diversifying risk into smaller chunks. I am investing out of state for this thoughts. Brilliant thought. Great reason. I think Mike summed it up for almost the same reason. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, it's a great strategy. That's what I've always liked about Anna Kay. You know, she's a very smart lady. She attends the Tacoma FI meetups. Very friendly, very smart, you know, doing a little bit of out of state investing, getting in a couple subtle jabs at Dion, being on my side. Clearly a highly intellectual woman. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Yeah, and I think Anna's also doing it really well where your out-of-state investment that you have that you recently took a trip to go see, that is near family. So you have people in the area, so you know the neighborhood, you know the area. It totally makes sense that you're doing it that way. Um, only problem I have is it would give me a reason to go and see family, and I've met my family, so no thanks. Great if you like yours, though. All night I had a good point. Anna, great investors value not losing more so than, than winning, considering the downside more than the upside. Great way to put it. Uh, Anna K does point out it's a lot more work on multiple cheaper houses. My thoughts are what my goal would be since I am at a stage in my life. Exactly. So a lot of a lot of the questions people have about these cheaper rentals when you buy these these out of state rentals and they're uh, a lot less expensive. You know, people are like, oh, well, you know, I mean, if I did buy four of them, aren't I going to have four times as many roofs to repair and four times as many floors to repair? Uh, that has not been my experience. So I have bought the first batch of like five that I got were all turnkey rental properties, day one, newly remodeled by people that I trusted and vetted. I have not had repairs stack up and issues. With, I mean, typical repair, like, oh yeah, the tenant broke something, you know, but that happens no matter what. Um, but I have not had tons of repairs uh, at, at an unequal level to what I've got going on next door, my duplex here. Now I have also bought project properties and done the burst strategy, which built into that process is the repair. So yeah, I have, I have some videos on my channel where I do talk about going through all the repairs and that type of stuff. But, but yeah, I mean, I think that the question here or whatever spurred it was, you know, someone saying, Oh, you're going to have more stuff that you have to do versus diversifying risk. Like, it, you know, it's not, if you buy the property right and it cash rolls from day one, you don't have to bank on rent increases. If you get it turnkey, you're not going to have a bunch of repairs unless you just happen to get unlucky, which could always happen at any point to anyone. Right. It's it's definitely, it's a balance. And the biggest factor in what you choose to invest in is you, right? Not the market, not timing the market, not the asset class. Yeah. It's what are your goals? What's your bandwidth? What, you know, what can you handle? What's your risk tolerance? And then I see that Dividend Dave <laughs> puts in a tax-deductible super chat, which is only true, I think, if you own a business and you're counting this as education. Uh, Dave works in that industry, so maybe he can let me know. Uh, says that a, 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 an emotional support, Dion, is tax-deductible under RCW, or IRC. I'm going to go RCW because that's our codes here in Washington. Uh, one, two, three. Sounds, sounds legitimate. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, I always say when I pull someone over and they're really just being dumb, like they've done like 50 different violations. And I'm just like, you know what? You're in violation of RCW 4661 643. 643 is my badge number. <laughs> well, what's that? I said, don't be a jerk when you're driving. Is that really a law? No, but it should be. <laughs> Super Troopers did a lot for law enforcement. Let me tell you. <laughs> okay. And Laura says, my resident is paying off house hacking. My pension is 150000 I want to build an ADU, move to the ADU and rent house to create my own pension. Yeah. That's the whole point of creating a pension is, is what strategy will work for you. Is building the right choice over buying? That kind of depends on your city. How, how is the build process there? Maybe talk to some contractors and see what their timelines are looking like. Are they easy to work with? Are they, are they against the idea? Um, a brilliant strategy for ADUs is some places uh, do not let you build an ADU as a rental. That's why they call it a mother-in-law house or a granny flat. Some family member has to move in there. So if you're building an ADU for you to move in, that might satisfy that. So then Dave would like me to get a one-sided dice roll. To roll. I know they make them. Uh, Peter, howdy. Jens went to a meetup in LA two days ago. It was multi-fam RE group. Pretty interesting. I was the only one without any rentals. Got to admit, was pretty intimidating, but people were really nice and welcoming. We all started with zero. Like, and we all remember that. 
you might run into the one or two arrogant people who think that, you know, the, the, literally size matters and it doesn't. Um, like running a truck driving school, I have learned things from a, te- from a, a student who was uh, 18, had been driving for a few months to get their car, came, drove the truck, and I would still be able to learn from them. Uh, so good job going, getting over the fear of that, finding that, getting around people who are doing this. Because remember, somebody is investing in your area successfully. Easiest way to find them is at a local meetup. Sometimes it's a Facebook meetup, you know, social media local. Uh, sometimes it's uh, an actual in-person Laura tells Mike, thanks, trying to figure this out ahead of time, thinking I may be able to retire earlier. Um, I think the three-year timeline, based on where you're at, is a, is a good horizon to shoot for. It's always possible to go sooner, but who knows what's going to happen. And if you plan on three years and you hit it sooner, great. If you plan on one year and it takes three, you're still retiring in three years, right? You're going to feel stressed, but... yeah. Let me see if there's any other questions coming in here. If I missed any, it's been, I'll probably be wrapping up here pretty soon. I'll put my email in the chat. Dion needs his World of Warcraft time. So if you guys could stop leaving questions for him, it's extremely inconsiderate. I mean, he's making this content for you, but really it was just so he could take a break while his raid got together uh, and got the group started. That's more accurate than you know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we don't raid till 1130, so I'm good for at least another 20 minutes. <laughs> right, and then and unless you start doing live streams on Saturdays, I'm probably going to start doing a Saturday live because Zuber used to do them every day, and I know that there was a group of people who liked them. Um, they won't happen before 9 a.m. if it's me. But yeah, see, uh, I'm smart enough to say you should do your live streams on Saturday, and if you end your live streams at noon, I will promptly start mine at noon 01, and then require you tell everyone to roll right into mine because that way at least oh there you go end of my live stream absolutely yeah that sounds like a good plan so if you ever get that figured out because you're you're on a kind of a rolling schedule right yeah unfortunately i do six weeks of working weekends and six weeks of not so uh fair enough dude i brought back up dion stick him up dude stick him up tell dion he's in trouble that's right. Mr. Steal your girl. All right. Get out of here, buddy. I'll, I'll talk to you later. I'm talking. Right. Okay. Well, I'll feed you in a minute. Get out of here, you little boy. Oh, no. Kid wants to eat. <laughs> <laughs> <We're>... <laughs> I wanted to hear his question, though. <laughs> he goes, by the way, Dad, can you put on the Halo Master Chief collection so I can play it? Sure, dude. Nice. My boy yeah. right there. <laughs> I'll come make you a sandwich in a minute. All right. Yeah. What's a, it's a good time to wrap up right there. Um, looking forward to seeing anybody who can make it to the Robin Hood Resort the weekend of the 21st um, you can book a cabin the phone number for the assistant Hannah is in the live chat I probably won't put it in a comment uh, later but if you email me my email is in the chat I will connect you with Hannah if your actual intention is to book it to see there we hope to see some people there it would be great um, we will be presenting but if you email me, we might actually, me and Mike would go and hang out, have like a kind of one-on-one on the side thing going on there for anybody who comes to the event too. So if you could hit the like on the way out, I would appreciate it. I appreciate everybody uh, who made it here in uh, present time and hello future land when you, when you see this. Uh, see you on Tuesday and if not next Saturday as well. Thanks a lot, Mike, for popping in. Uh, you, should, yeah. you should text me next time if I do a live and you're available. We'll always have you come in. It's great. Um, especially if we're going to have an, a, a heated debate, you know, <laughs> where, where I make a comment and and, and you're just wrong. <laughs> oh, wow. It's his live stream, so he gets to have the last word. Typical. 